What's up, Coach? Oh, wait. Hold on. You are muted. Let's see if I can. Got it. Good? All right. Beautiful. How are you? Good, okay. brother. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I, I really appreciate it. This is going to be fun. Yeah, no, I'm down. It's going to be fun. Awesome. So, since it's recording already and I don't want to do too much editing, I'll just get right into it. Cool. Um, so, I'm Mike Pendleton, a writer, pod host, or BJPen.com, my MMA news. And this is going to be these Zoom meetings are going to be part of uh, the Inside the Cage series on BJPen.com. And uh, my guest at this time is head coach over at Extreme Couture. I think by the time quarantine is over, he's never going to want to hear from me again. <laughs> uh, I, I blow up his phone almost daily, but, uh, you know, quickly, I'll give him a lot of credit, Coach. I give you a ton of credit for a lot of stuff, but uh, I could say I, I have a new friendship during this quarantine, so uh, it's been fun. Yeah, me as, me as well, brother. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, we struck up a good relationship, and it's, uh, it's nice to have people like you in the industry, man. Well, uh, so the basis of what we're going to do is, uh, without all the weed, I will not confirm or deny if there are adult beverages. And they're up oh, there they are <laughs> um, without the weed we are going to basically do kind of a, a different version of Joe Rogan's fight companion um, the difference here kind of the whole premise beside behind the name inside the cage is not only who are the fighters that I've interviewed on the series already what makes them who they are inside the cage but in opportunities like this with you coach Let's go back into these fights. If you pick three fights, uh, we're going to watch. And just so everyone can follow along, I'll name all three fights. And, Coach, for you, feel free to stop at any time. Um, there may be moments where I'll, I'll strike and be like, oh, God, all right, what happened here? Um, and then, obviously, between rounds, we'll talk a little bit. But that's kind of the basis of, of what I want to do here with you and in this show moving forward. Um, first and foremost, just to kind of get things started, we're going to start with Dan Ige and we're going to start with Contender Series be, without specifically talking about Dan. I mean, you're in Vegas, the heart of the UFC. Uh, you know, when you have a show like Contender Series, so, so many people that I know go, dude, prefer that way much more than Ultimate Fighter. Ultimate Fighter served its purpose, but what is Contender Series like for you as a coach? You know, it, it was uh, – it was – it took some getting used to, I think, because a lot of us, uh, when you go to that and you'll, you know, when we watch the fight, you'll see it's almost like a, a glorified sparring session because your entire team is there. And at one point, I remember almost like looking back, I remember looking back at Misha because Misha's yelling and I'm like, hey, be quiet. You know, like it's so intimate. <laughs> it's such an intimate setting. And it's almost kind of a this raucous crowd of just people just screaming and yelling, and and I'm I swear to you after uh, Dan fought, I remember having a team meeting saying anytime any of our guys are the contender series, you guys need to act accordingly because your voice and everything is causing so much pandemonium that it's such a small setting. We need to be calm during this time, you know, because it was man. I mean. It fed a lot of energy, but some fighters might, you know, especially the hometown guys, it's going to take away from a lot from what the actual co coaching and cornering. I love that because I think that's something I never thought about. The one thing I've, I always get overly excited when I talk to contender series guys and like Puna Soriano and Danny Gay, I think they both were like, how is this guy so excited to talk? Like we fought on contender series. Like what? But my, I'll ask you the same question I asked them. Not only are they fighting against their opponent, they've got to have the most stand-out performance change some of the more mental I say, hey, you might want to go for Bart, and we have to be. You have to perform this way to stand out above everybody else. Yeah, you you nailed it. And and the the one thing too, you have to just make sure of is, hey, go get a win, right? But we have to push a pace. You have to set a tone. 
and you're actually, you know, you're looking for that finish and you're looking to, to put a, a statement out there to impress uh, Dana and Sean and Mick. And you're absolutely right. But at the end of the day, you, you still got to go make sure you get a W. That's going to count on your record. It's going to help your pay. And then you're, you're, you're probably not going to make it in with the loss. So let's go, let's go get a W. Let's go assess the situation and find our openings and then go be able to capitalize on those openings to go get a win. Before we uh, get into this fight, so those Dan Ige against Luis Raul Gomez, kind of, if you can, take me behind the scenes of what it was like getting Dan prepared for this fight and uh, ultimately right before we hit play and start this fight. Very quick turnaround from our fight in uh, Titan FC. Uh, we fought in Miami, I believe, maybe a month and a half prior. So then we, we jumped right in, and then uh, we had a, we had a twi quick turnaround camp. We, there wasn't much tape on Gomez. We didn't have a lot to uh, break down. And uh, we just for, took what we could out of it and, uh, you know, basically prepared Danny Ige the best way we knew possible and uh, let, let, you know, let the show happen. All right, we're going to go in. So uh, I guess courtesy of UFC Fight Pass. Now, for those listening and watching, um, because of YouTube copyright infringements and Dana White's got enough on his plate. I don't need him banging on my door to never show fights again off Fight Pass. Um, we'll have the fights on and then Coach and I will kind of just go through them. So we'll be watching them. You guys feel free to follow along at home. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can fire up Fight Pass. If you're not poor like me, maybe you can have YouTube and Fight Pass up at the same time, however you want to do it. So we'll get into it right away. Um, I'll, I'll maybe even stop at the tail of the tape because um, I think that's the first thing all fight fans really look at so uh, same height Luis Gomez came in at 146 Dan came in at 145 and a half but three inch reach advantage that's not a lot and I think we kind of over magnify reaches when it's six seven eight inches but how much does having just a three inch reach help in preparation he utilizes his reach very well. So, I mean, uh, you got to think about it, man. And inches, inches are the difference be between uh, winning and losing in this game. Same thing in football. It's all about the inches. And it's really how you utilize them. You know, sometimes you'll see taller fighters. Stefan Struve comes to mind. Sometimes I don't see Stefan Struve actually using his range correctly, right? Like he, let, he lets a lot of fights come into the clinch and things of that sort where – as Dan, he utilizes his jab really well. And you'll see a little bit of the technique in this fight of the way he throws his cross. We call it more of an alley cross. So his alley cross has a lot more extension on it by having just a little bit of extra reach. So in hopes of not only becoming a smarter person in this sport, um, but also to help the casuals, I'll probably stop it at any point in where a big moment happens. But you feel free if there was something when you were in the corner and you were like, yeah, 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 I needed it. I was thinking this or I need to address this. Feel free to speak up at any time, but I will get it started now. Got it. So. Love Herzog, man. That's my guy. <laughs> Jason Herzog, one of the yeah. best and very quiet. Very, very much so, but uh, always a uh, relief to know when he's uh, coming in your locker room and says, I got you guys. You know, it's, it's, it's nice to have him. I love that. I love that. You don't, you don't often hear when, when uh, coaches and fighters have certain fighters that, that they prefer. You know, he's, he's fair. You know, he's, he's going to be fair and he's going to give you the best opportunity. So, I mean, that's, that's what I like about him. The, uh, it's Bellator, obviously. Um, but uh, I was at the Michael Chandler Patricio Pitbull fight, and uh, someone in the media room made a comment that uh, when the referee who stopped the fight was a good local ref. And Chandler went, Oh, that, well, that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so you see here, Jason's really on him right now for grabbing the cage. How quickly, because we see Dan get the takedown here within the first minute of the fight. Was that something you guys were particularly focused on as utilizing his wrestling? Uh, we wanted to see how Gomez came out. We thought he was going to try to come out fast. Just like you were talking earlier about strategies, I, I can see a lot of people looking to come out fast. And uh, we thought that if that was the case, we were just going to level change on him and put him on his ass. Um, and Gomez did come 
a little hard. He checked you know, through some nice leg kicks at Dan. But that's always going to be Dan's kind of ultimate um, way of just slowing the fight down and is his takedown, is his wrestling and his clinch game. So, yeah, we, we, we just said, hey, man, we can, we can utilize this right now. And in a way, too, Mike, it's a lot like uh, in football when you just – when you run a play up the middle, it's not necessarily to gain seven or eight yards. It's to what? Pull the linebackers up, you know? Right, And, right. and show, that, show them the capability of what we have. So now our level change has a lot more validity to it. So if we want a faint level change, he has to worry about the takedown now. So it is it's, – it's, it's really to set up things later on down the line. So we're two minutes in here to the first round of Dan Ige on Contender Series. And obviously, speaking to that wrestling, when you have Dan train with a guy like Khabib, now I know it's not all the time, but in those moments in which they do get some work in together, can you as a coach see that from knowing who Khabib is and knowing his talent level and his wrestling skills, and you see Dan in the gym, can you see that he's picked up from training with Khabib? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pause it every time we yeah. talk just so we don't get um, backed up. But so I'm big on allowing my guys to go and train. And I don't want them not to be able to train with other people or other coaches. That's, that's too close-minded. There's a lot of great talent out there. And the beautiful thing about my relationship with Dan is we're, we're open to that. And he goes out and trains at AKA and he comes back better. My only caveat to that is, is when you learn stuff, you have to share it right? Don't, don't not show us and don't not tell us because we all want to get better. And if you're, if you're not open-minded and willing to get better, you might as well quit because you have no more growth available to you. So for Dan, knowing that he's been working with a guy like Khabib and they're constantly training together, um, that's, that's, I think it's imperative for his game because it sets a mindset. You know, you know, what, you know what a champion looks like and you know how he prepares and you want to walk that same path or push yourself further than what he does. Um, I want to say something too. When you're about about the three minute mark, if you if you back up a little bit of the three minute mark, I want you guys to watch Dan Ige's motion. Right, watch his constant level changing and feints. So we establish a takedown earlier in the round. Right now, the level changes and feints are going to set up at the 256 mark that right overhand. So if you back up to about uh, back up to about two minutes and thirty seconds, and just just watch his feints and level changes. Yeah, I'm actually right there. You were talking, uh, I'm actually right at the three minute mark. You said 256, the overhand right comes in. Really for those watching, you can kind of see it right before that three minute mark. You can see those, those feints that coach is talking about here. Yep, uh, yep. And then you so, mentioned. Yep, in the corner, we call that levels. I'll, I'll say, hey, hey, give me some levels. And that's what he'll do. So the rhythm is level changing. And what we're looking for and uh, depending on what you're throwing and what type of fighter uh, and stance he is, is which hand is he looking to underhook on? So if, if, if he's a, a orthodox and he's looking to lead arm underhook on a shot, well, that's what we're gauging on because that's the side he's covering for, for the overhand. So we establish a takedown early in the round. Now we want to level change and see if we can get him to drop that hand to dig an underhook and come over top. I love it. Where are you at? I want to make sure we're at, we're at the same pace here. Uh, I'm at I'm at basically three minutes, right where that overhand's at. Got it. I'm I just at, want to make sure I'm queued up here. That's I, I jumped the gun. I will. I'm at three oh five. I'll let you know when I'm at three, and then we can keep this going. So I am now at three minutes. I'm right here with you. Perfect. So again, like these are little things too that this is great. I get to talk to you, Mike. Uh, and, I, and for all the fans, I want you guys or, or, the, or the listeners, I want you to watch the cage control. That is one of the biggest things that I was taught by Randy was cutting off the cage and constantly keeping guys on the back pedal. You're going to see that a lot in Danny Ige's fights. And that's something that we have bred in him through our system. Just watch the way he keeps this guy on his back foot and constantly pressing that cage. Beautiful. So are you starting now? Yep, three minutes. Awesome. So failed takedown, but watch. Failed takedown, what does he do? He reestablishes center again, right? Switch steps, switch steps, reestablish the center, walks him back down, pushing him to that barrier, in and out. So now you have room to move, right? He resets his feet, we're at halfway, boom, right hand lands. 
might be a second or two behind you. But, no, I think uh, establishing that distance is, is so key. But also, estab- yep, I was a few seconds there behind you. So that right hand lands. So, so here's a moment, and, and maybe I'm a few seconds behind. I'm at 227. Um, up, here's up. a moment, though, where you see, obviously, Dan lands the right hand, and he's pressing forward, pressing forward. What's going through your mind as you sit in that corner that you need to win? And this is a huge moment, but we don't want to overexert ourselves. Right. Um, again, that's on his discretion. So he's the gonna he's gonna be the best pilot to that. He knows he knows best uh, where he's at. Rather than I mean, I we all know that he was rocked, right? So Dan has to maintain that creative control while he's in there. Now, if I if I could see something from the outside where the guy's legs are wobbling or something else that happened to Mike Santiago fight, it happened to the Danny Henry fight, where Dan might not know that he's rocked and we have to let him know, hey, it's on you to go in there and, and go look for that finish. So by dropping him, um, we always want to calculate. You don't want to rush and run into something like, uh, you know, think about uh, Steve Smith, hands of stone, knocking out. Um, was it Lytle? I can't remember who he starts. Yeah, yeah we get hit in the liver and he comes out or a Pete cell. And, uh, you know, so you want to calculate you, it, it, he's hurt, he's hurt, but you also don't want to come running into something that, that is unnecessary. So we always say, calculate, take your time, calculate, see what you got here. So I'm, I'm right where you're at. So he hits them. Um, now one of the setups here for the, for the listeners is we, what we call a shake step. So Dan did it about three times in this sequence. He shake stepped off to his right to set up his right cross. Shake step, shake step, and then the shake step again, and the and then the angle for the right cross came in. And watch him just dart, bam, hits him right over top that left shoulder. Let me ask you this: We can pause it real quick because I, sure. I just want to hit on something that you mentioned. Now, and, and I definitely mean this with all due respect. I in Chicago, I was around a lot of regional fights, which meant I was around a lot of regional coaches, a lot of regional gyms, a lot of amateur fighters, a lot of young professional fighters. And I think an overwhelming occurrence at that level, and this is not to compare what you do to them, but you just kind of talked about you, the, like Dan has to learn when to come forward where, and maybe you can speak on this a little bit, coaches at that stage, and I don't know if you were ever in this stage as a coach, where with younger fighters, they have this moment to capitalize and you just start hearing maybe not even you, but other coaches screaming forward, forward, forward. They're, they're very animated in the corner. And it's, mm-hmm. to me, it, it should never have to come to that for both the fighter. Now, there may be moments, like you said, where you have to point it out. But I don't know if you have to be overly animated to let your fighter know they need to go win this fight. Well, that, that and you got to think, too, uh, the risk reward. You know, you're, like you are saying earlier, or, or can you blow your load? Can you overexert yourself in those positions you know, and then if I'm screaming and yelling, that's just going to elevate the stress level of your fighter as well. So it makes it a, a, a kind of a moment of pandemonium. He knows, and he has to just be that. I always say to Dan, our analogy is be a serial killer, right? Just, you, you got to be, you got to be diligent. You got to make sure you're checking all the boxes and, you know, and, 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 and cleaning up your mess and just being the serial killers, man. Like they don't, there's a reason why those fuckers don't get caught for so long. Right. <laughs> right, like you, right. Got, you, you gotta be, you gotta be slick in there, man. And you gotta be, you gotta be diligent with your, with your craft and you can't just go and overexert yourself on something stupid. So I'm at 223. I'm going to resume it. We're at the same spot. I'm assuming. Yep. Yep. He's working that single leg dumps him on the single leg. Now, here's a spot on the ground there where Dan likes to rush the hooks. I'm not a big fan of that. I like to kind of uh, crowd the head a little bit more, but in this situation, it worked out. I want Dan to flatten him out, um, and that's where the scrambles begin. So something that we worked on a lot with Dan is to slow down the scrambles and not get so jujitsu, but rather settle your weight. Again, He was start still being seeing, very patient there. Very um, much. At about the 158 mark that's where i'm at but you know uh gomez fell back as he was getting up from the ground you saw dan kind of come in but he he stayed patient calculates right yeah again as a judge as a judge you got to think about scoring criteria too as a coach and a fighter is cage control actively looking to move this man backwards and that's what we're doing now there's a faint level change to the uppercut so we changed an angle 
right? You have to be able to hit both your overhand, your right cross, and your uppercut by, by showing your level changes. Again, faint level changes when the guy's backs to the cage. Now he's worried about the takedown. Now look, and pawn at the jab, calculating. Kicks aren't that great, you know, that, that gave up a takedown. He didn't get his leg back in time. The guy caught it. But he actively is looking for an arm bar now. Switches off. He's going to maybe do it an inverted triangle. But here, although it doesn't look good aesthetically on your back to the judges, Dan did so much in round one, and this guy's doing absolutely nothing on top. And, and nothing. with about 45 seconds left on my clock, where are you at in, if you can go back to this night um, in this corner? Obviously, you said Dan did a lot in round one. We're approaching 30 seconds. You know you're about to have your first talk with him, or maybe he's going to finish it. You don't know. Right. But where are you at in your mindset as a coach? Uh, I'm super happy with round one and the, and the output. And I think for me, uh, really was just make sure that you're staying calculated. I don't want you rushing something that where you're going to walk into something stupid because this, this fight right now, I know the finish is going to be there for you, but you just have to let it come. Don't make it happen. Right. You see a lot of guys swinging for home runs and, and they never, they never hit them, but the home run will appear when you just, when you set it up correctly. So that's really my, my assessment for him. And more level changes, right? Like he scored those takedowns. Now we have a lot of, a lot of uh, validity now in our level change. So I'm at the end of round one. We'll stop it here. I don't, uh, I don't know if you want to kind of touch on anything else that, that you may have told Dan in the corner here. But before I have you answer that, I'll ask you this. We saw in the last 20 seconds, Dan pulled what a lot of casual fans will recognize Nate Diaz does a lot. When he thinks he has you hurt or when he knows the fight's going his way, his hands came down and he just marched forward. I, I've got to assume that's something you don't necessarily like. Um, depends on the range that he's doing it out, out of. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, some guys do that in range and it's, 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 uh, it's rolling the dice. Some guys are really good at doing that and allowing the fighter to, uh, to, to overexert themselves and they're able to pull off of that. Um, and draw guys in you know there's like Boston Salmon for example he's one that's got some of the fastest hands in the gym Boston will do that quite a bit but it also has hurt him in his UFC career too because you get accustomed to doing things at a different level and four ounce gloves so it is it's a catch-22 at times but um, you know again like as a coach you 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 want to you want to allow your fighter to maintain creative control as long as they're not doing something stupid right I love that so allowing them to be who they are and, and who they need to be in the fight. Um, before we get into round two, is there anything you think or you remember telling Dan after round one? Nothing. Uh, I mean, nothing that really stands out. I was very happy with round one. I think round one just wanted to reassert the fact of uh, uh, his breathing. Um, I remember mentioning his step over right hook because the guy was bailing a certain direction where the right hand would be there. He has a step over right hook that he throws that's very nice or his switch cross. So I think you'll start seeing a little bit of that coming out in round two. Awesome. I'm still going through the replays here. I'll let you know when my round two is ready, when we're all queued up. Yeah, great. Ray Seffo in the corner. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, Dennis Davis and myself. Uh, I mean, just a wealth of knowledge, man. I mean, I've been so blessed to be able to cor – I corner both of those guys in my, in my coaching career, both Coach Ray and, and Dennis. You know, absolutely love having those guys in the corner, man. They're just a wealth of knowledge. There's Misha Tate in the back in the yellow, screaming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, soon to be mother, right? She hasn't had the second yep. one. Yep, little boy. All right, I am ready for round two. Yep. Oh, let me ask you this, because we're kind of seeing it. And I, and I believe Jason Herzog is issuing a warning or just telling him to watch his uh, hands, now, like with grabbing the cage. Now, as a coach, and, and, and sometimes we've seen it deliberately, sometimes it, it just happens. The ref has to take an extra moment or two to have a conversation with either the red corner or the blue corner. When it's happened to you in fights, if it's not your fighter, does that help? Sometimes does it make you angry or do you like it because you want to get these issues resolved? But let's say in Dan's case where he's winning this fight, you're like, hey, I want to get back to business. Yeah, it definitely depends on the stoppage and where it's at and the momentum. Like, again, like, I think this is why Herzog's one of the best guys in the, in the sport to do it. He did it during a time when it, it, it really wasn't too imperative. He also brought the translator in to make sure that this guy understood the instructions that he was given. 
So, you know, he, he clarified everything the way he was supposed to do it. Now, if you keep doing it in the middle of a fight or a guy keeps spitting out his mouthpiece over and over and over and you're allowing that to happen where it's almost timidity. Yeah, certain, certain refs like to insert themselves um, and be a part of the fight rather than, than just watch the fight. You'll see that a lot. Referees want to make sure that they're seen on, on, on TV, right? <laughs> interesting interesting yeah. maybe an off-camera conversation now because sure. now it's going to be something i look for uh, yeah for sure starting round two danny gave versus luis raul gomez on dana white's contender series from back in 2017 for those watching along with us um warning has been issued we're getting back out there coach Level. nick sick of extreme couture is happy he's also happy on this zoom call with me because he's drinking and watching fights <laughs> This is, yeah, watching my boy too. Let's just like painting masterpieces. This kid's, this kid's gonna be something, man. I'll tell you. He's actually texting me right now. Okay, <laughs> that's funny. So he starts off pressing forward right away. What would you say about? And I'm gonna pause here at four thirty when it hits that point. But what Got would you it? say about that interaction uh, between both fighters? Go, it, Dan's not necessarily hurting him, but he's almost, and all due respect to Mr. Gomez here, but he's almost looking like me on a Friday night trying, you know, trying to make my, my way home. He, he knows where he's at. He's not necessarily hurt, but he, he doesn't have his wherewithal in him. Like, he, he's kind of stumbling around, and mm -hmm. it's, it's not allowing Dan to truly – go in and dominate him, it just kind of seems a little sloppy in that moment. Yeah, so really we want to um, we want to apply dominance right away. We want to set a tone. And the tone that we're setting, if you watch the way Gomez is moving, is he's not attacking by any means. He's almost kind of drawing Dan in, hoping to be able to counter Dan. And Dan is being very calculated. Now, if nothing were to really happen within that first minute of the round, which you watch, the scoring criteria would go in our favor because Dan put him on the back pedal the entire round or the entire first minute. And that's important. Now, remember, if your guy's a little tired, you want to talk about fight IQ. How do you establish fight IQ in that moment? Well, hey, I want you breathing, but I also want you to make sure that you're keeping the cage control. That's a scoring criteria. Move this guy backwards, catch your breath. And when you're ready, you start seeing your openings, use your movement, your feints, and then start attacking. Beautiful. So I'll keep going here at 430. Yeah, showing a little switch, switch cross, uh, off steps. Again, just showing him something out of range, right? Notice he's out of range, but he's still showing something that makes the guy think. Like, oh, shit, is he going to switch cross on me? What's he doing here? What, is he throwing a switch kick? And maybe it's just nothing. Maybe it's smoke and mirrors, but it's nice to show it out of range. Just let him think about something. See, that's the beauty of why I wanted to start this, and we see the overhand right there at the four-minute mark. Um, but that's the beauty of, of why I wanted you and other coaches and fighters to break this stuff down for all of us is because it's those little things where, you know, I've picked up on and back in 2017 when I was watching this, I was still only two years into the sport, now five years into the sport, but it's those little things like that, you know, I, I hate to uh, give any attention to the bad times in my life, but when I was dating my ex, I remember we were all out for the Tyron Woodley, Robbie Lawler fight. And it was one of the first times I ever noticed feints and movements. And uh, we can, I, I can get into story time here in a second, but uh, I'll stop at 3.20. But I remember telling her when Tyron was fainting and fainting, I was like, oh, shit. And she was like, what? I was like, he's getting ready to throw a bomb. And if mm -hmm. people can recall that whole fight, that whole first round, Tyron's just fainting and, and dipping and moving. Yep. And they were booing, even in the Buffalo Wild Wings we were at. They were like, yeah. what is this? And obviously, that's a whole nother conversation of how right. fans don't Casuals. know what they, Right. Yeah. And, and I'm like, you just – and that was – UFC 201 is when I started taking notice of, of that exact thing, of movements of fighters without causing damage. And, exactly. and just to see Tyron explode from those feints to that right hand. And it came off of a uh, – questionable separation when the mm -hmm. two were up against the cage yeah the uh referee split them and then tyring was able to get back into that form so that's what i love about you kind of pointing that out because it's these little things where i think if this series starts to catch some steam 
fans mm -hmm. will have a better understanding of what they're watching because we're no longer – and this is the, my only message to casuals. We're not in the Coliseum days anymore. We're not mm -hmm. going to have fighters walking out with heads in their right. hands. Like, it, right. it just doesn't happen. You know, yeah. I, and I think – go ahead. But, the, but exactly your point. Think about the feints is you're collecting data. What you're looking for is the reactions to what you're, you're throwing if they respect that, re if you, they respect that reaction. Right, you 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 feign a knee. Does he does he drop level? Is he what is he doing off of these feints? And you collect that data for yourself, and not only for your coaches as well. So it's very important, you know. And it, it transcends, man. It's base. Think about baseball. You might throw yeah. a curveball to set up something later on in the in the in the in the uh, in the at bat, right? I mean, that's the same thing you're doing here. So if you look at the corner cam, uh, they they go over the corner cam in this particular spot here, about the three three thirty mark. Um, yep. I literally, I literally yell at Dan, hey, put him on his ass. I want to, <laughs> I, I literally yell, Dan, hey, put him on his ass. And then you see Dan walk, uh, walk him down, goes in for the double. Is he on the single? Yeah, he's on, yeah, he's on the double and uh, puts him on his ass. Right. So this takedown here doesn't look like a whole lot. Right. Um, but it does again reestablish our fancy level changes. And now we get to work a little bit of the ground and pound. Um, we get to be heavy on this guy. See how he covers his chest? Heavy, heavy, yeah. heavy. Okay, the guy gets up. But now look at the guy's body language. See him misstepping? Look at his and he's kind of fainting back a little bit, leaning Correct. back. Correct. Correct. Now here comes – now Dan should be level changing more. He's not. He needs to be on his levels more, right now especially. So the right cross is a little bit more telegraphed. Had he level changed more, that's going to have – see, there we go. Now we're and level And then he changing. goes right back to his level changes. Yep reestablish the cage yeah there's that cage cut off now this guy scores a nice knee tap right and goes to kimura immediately he goes to a side control position that we actually have a, a arm uh right there it's called a sneaky pete that dennis kind of uh, made popular one of our uh one of our pro guys won a title by breaking a guy's arm in that position really? hands in right now pretty crazy yeah juan camilo broke a guy's arm all, like in half Oh, it's nuts. Yeah, it was, it's nuts. It's a modified Americana. So now I'm losing my shit on Dan. I'm, I'm <laughs> right here. I'm, I don't. I don't like this. Um, I don't like Dan playing off his back. But I know Dan well enough uh, that this is a place where he's he's comfortable and he's fine and he's almost resting. You know, I'm, I'm asking him to build up a base, which he did. He needs to clear that leg. He's playing half guard again. He needs to dig under hooks. I don't like full guard. But again, when you watch Gomez, watch the damage that he's inflicting. Absolutely nothing. Right. I was just going to say, so uh, I'm at the 130 mark here. So exactly. I, same. We can, we can keep this rolling here uh, unless you want to pause it. You let me know roll after the yeah, question. Roll it. Um, I know you said you're losing your shit on Dan, but at the same time, where does that urgency come from you in that moment? Because you can tell Gomez – if not for nothing, yes, he's trying to establish position. He's trying to do damage on Dan. But we've seen almost two full rounds of him really not doing much. Why do you still have that urgency? Um, probably just my nature of I don't like being on our <laughs> back, you know, and I think that has a lot to do with it. Uh, and I know a lot of judges in Nevada, I know a lot of judges aren't very good at actually seeing that you, what you and I are seeing right now. So they're looking at it as ride time, whether you and I are looking at it as this guy just laying on top of him doing no damage. Dan did all the damage this round. He truly did. Um, but in a way, I think it added a little bit of urgency to me and Dan because I wanted him to come out the third round. I knew we won round two, but I told him we didn't. I told him it was 1-1 <laughs> one, one going into three because I knew that was going to light a fire on his ass. I mean, that's what we talked about before. You got to know your guy, man, and I know what yep. he needed to hear. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into, uh, before round three starts, a couple things here that we saw. Uh, Jason Herzog stood him up because he saw what you and I saw. There wasn't really much from Gomez uh, on the ground. Dan did throw a spinning back fist, and that's actually where I'm going to go as this round ends. And uh, I'll pause it here. Um, yes, you know, Gomez had top position. Dan was able to work back up. And you, uh, we're talking contender series. We kind of talked about how you have to make that statement. Spinning back fist makes all the statements in the world if it lands and knocks your guy out. In that moment, is it just something you felt Dan was throwing to throw um, because it wasn't really the, the spacing and where they were? It was pretty off. 
Um, what did you make of like throwing a spinning back fist in that moment? Uh, it's, a, it's a calculated risk and you're right. If it lands, it's a highlight reel. But if you also, if you look at like what happened to Paige Van Zant, you know, she broke her arm and hasn't really been the same since on uh, she broke her arm on Jessica Rose Clark's head doing a yeah. spinning back fist and broke her uh, ulna and radius, I believe both bones. So yeah, it's a calculated risk again, but you know, there's about 30 seconds left in the round. I'm okay with him trying for something and, and making it look a little flashy. That might be something if it lands, whether it, it sways a judge, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm good with him doing that there. And uh, we'll probably get into it more in the next fight about your corner conversations, but you kind of just talked about, uh, you told Dan you, he, he, he didn't win round two, and even though you were confident, he did. For those that may have not have heard our interview, our audio interview that we did, why is it so important for you to kind of know your fighters why? Um, I think it's moments like this going into the third and understanding what they need to hear to push them through maybe a point of fatigue, a point of, a point of doubt. Um, sometimes they have to hear that, they, that, that you believe in them. There's, there's a lot of different things that they need to hear. In this particular situation, I remember telling Dan that this man, I remember pointing back at Gomez, is, uh, is standing in between you and, and what you want out of your life and your dreams, what you set out for. This man right here for the next five minutes is going to try to take those dreams away from you. And it's going to be a, a matter of how do you want to, how do you want to finish this fight? Right? So, you know, the guy was tough, but I knew Dan could put him away. Now let me, and I know I've asked you this before, but for those again, who may have missed it, where does that come from? Because that's so different from most of what we see from coaches and corners where the human element is really not a, a, a focus point for them, but for you it is. Yeah, um, I think really just a lot of time in the gym together and spending rounds and corner rounds, it's important to, uh, to corner your guys during the sparring. Um, it's important to do MMA cardio rounds together because you reach a fatigue point. There's a lot of underlining things that I think that people miss out on. So, you know, MMA cardio rounds on the surface sounds like you're just trying to make sure they're in shape. Yeah. But you're also trying to get them to a point of fatigue where they can listen to instructions. They're able to hear your voice under duress. Um, and you want to be able to, to give them a sense of calm. And, you know, there, there's, there's moments there where you have to be able to look into a guy's eyes and know like, Hey man, this dude believes in me just as much as I believe in my, myself. And, and I'm going to go pull this out, you know? So it's very important just to be able to have that relationship with your fighters, in my opinion. Well, fun, fun story, quick start before we get into round three, for those that may have missed it also, you told the story of how, and it scared me because I, I know I mentioned I want to come down to Vegas. I want to come check out the gym. But you said Saturday, your Saturday practices, when you do a lot of those MMA cardio uh, rounds, and you said a lot of the fighters hate them. But you actually said uh, Francis Ngannou came up to you after one of the most recent ones. And there was a brief conversation where you just knew something clicked with Francis and it showed his championship mindset. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, so here's just a little kind of part of even to that to add on. I gave him the option to take today off. I said, Hey, do you want to take today off? And, and, you know, you, just because of the way, the way this whole thing has been going on with fights being canceled and off and on, I said, Hey man, do you want to take the day off today? And he said, no, bro, today's a uh, MMA cardio rounds. Let's go. And I said, okay, <laughs> let's go. So he came over, came over for dinner last night. Um, he had dinner with the family. And then after dinner, I just said, Hey, if you want to take tomorrow off, you know, I'm good with it. And he, he said, no, I'll see you in the morning, 11 o'clock. And I said, all right, I'll be there. <laughs> all right. Well, if I come to Vegas, I definitely want to do the dinner. I don't know if I'll see you at 11 a.m. for those MMA cardio <laughs> rounds. I'm dragging your ask, ass in there. <laughs> I got to address what, and, and I love seeing Francis play soccer with your little one, but dude's relentless with the kids as well. Like he was not letting him score on him. I love it too. And he made it, he made his little ass cry. And I, you know, it's fun because he's <laughs> almost like you had a, you, it's almost like cornering a fight. You had to like pick your kid up and like, Hey man, it's all right. Like dust them <laughs> off and, and let him know it's okay to lose every once in a while. But um, Francis is an unbelievable spirit, man. He's got a great heart. He, all three of my kids, he spends so much time with and, and is very interactive. Him and Avery have a great relationship because of soccer. Um, he was, McKenna's my dancer and him and McKenna were doing salsa dancing last night. Like he's just a great soul. And, and I think a lot of people just see this big human being that's knocking everybody out. 
but this, this man is very intelligent. He's a very smart businessman, but he's got a huge, huge heart. And he's also the only person now on record to lift Shaquille O'Neal. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's get into round three here. Uh, we're looking at Dan Ige, Luis Ro Gomez on Contender Series from July of 2017 with Mike Pendleton, myself, and Coach Eric Nixick of Extreme Couture. So Coach says Dan's up 2-0, but he tells Dan it's 1-1 going into the third. I think I just tell him, I said, hey, you never know what you're going to get out of these judges. So I always try to err on the side of caution, right? I think we're up two rounds, but I'm not going to tell him that. I want him to feel like there's a little bit of urgency there. Yeah, I love that there's conversations that can be had between coaches and fighters about judges. But then, like, me as a media guy, if that's what people want to call me, and, like, family and friends or, or casual fans, you know, if, if I can only make one comment about judges without going deep with them, I'll just be like, yeah, Joe Rogan famously once said that a woman's a nice lady, but he, he doesn't want her judging anything that, she, <laughs> that he's around, you know, without mentioning names. So it's like it, it kind of sets the precedent where it's like, hey, if one of the top names thinks she's a nice person but not the greatest judge, that should tell you everything you need to know about judging. Yep. <laughs> I got some stories about that one too, but <laughs> – <laughs> I love she, it. She is a very nice lady. She is. <laughs> she is. So uh, Jason Herzog begins the action here in round three. Dan comes out. I, I, do you think he believes you in this moment? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love this kid, man. Like, I just, just watching this kid, like, there's not too many people in the world that, like, I, I hold in, in the admiration that I do for Dan. On the 430 mark, you're going to watch Dan land a very nice switch cross. That's compliments to my man, uh, Dwayne Ludwig. Obviously, I'm a belt under, um, I'm belted under Dwayne. He's one of my senseis. And this is some of the stuff that I get to teach to Dan. So he hits him with a nice switch cross. You'll see this kind of evolve later on in Dan's career. The switch cross hook, he adds the kick. He does other things with that switch cross. But it's a nice little wrinkle in Dan's striking. We see a little bit more urgency. Again, I, I feel like I'm, I'm hating on Gomez, but just a little bit more sloppiness, eagerness from him to try and make something happen. What are you taking in a minute into this third round? Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy with where we're at, but I want to see, see everything Dan does right now in the third round is with aggression. I love it, right? Every takedown he defends, he throws the guy off of him. Every punch he throws, he's trying to take this guy's head off. Right. So that that aesthetically to the judges looks very important. You're going to see a moment here. I'm about the 330 mark right now. He look at him defend this takedown. Right. There's there's spots here like, OK, we can't rest here. And I'm yelling that you cannot rest here at all. So he's the guard is open, which is great. We're not sitting in closed guard. He has feet on the hips. He's pushing off. I think we end up almost even Granby rolling here or trying to roll roll out of this. Um, but there's urgent. Uh, you could obviously see me in the corner yelling, and then Gomez lets him off the hook. So again, right away, marches him down. Look at the cage control. Look at the right hand that lands because of the cage control. Look at him skating out the sides now. Coach Sefo throwing hands in the corner there. Throwing hands. <laughs> so watch this Kimura. Watch this rip off. Right. He almost yeah, rips this guy's arm out of his socket. This is that's this is the, beautiful. This is Do the you, type of aggression that this kid has. Now, maybe for those, and I'll pause it here at 2.30 because uh, that's a very aggressive Kimura that we don't normally see a lot. We'll see fighters go for that position, but they don't rip down on it the way mm. Dan did there. When he has it but doesn't have it and it's not going to win the fight, how do you or how would you like to see your fighters go from an aggressive Kimura where he's going down with it but it's not there? What's the next move for, in your eyes? end up on top or back into a, in a, in either a dominant position or a neutral spot. So he defended the, he defended the takedown by, by wrapping up the Kimura. He sat back, used his entire body weight, which is the correct uh, technique, and almost ripped this guy's arm off. Now, by doing so, the next transition is what? Dan now has this guy's back. So he created a scramble. And the one thing that I love about Dan Ige is he, he, he fights hard during these scrambles he always wants to be in these types of positions by doing so this is ultimately what's, what's going to win him the fight now when he gets back control the thing that i'm big on and i actually learned a lot from randy and coach dennis davis is when you get back control it's imperative to flatten guys out 
And this is what Dan does. You want to drive the hips in, you want to curl your heels up, and you want to take this man's hips away. So watch. Uh, I'm at 230 mark. I'll hit play. If you just watch the way Dan ground and pounds, the guy builds a base, breaks him back down, hips in, and then starts the damage. Right? Bridge yeah. up, breaks him back down again, break down, break down, now damage. This is over and over again to where now we have two minutes to work. This is, the, this is a fight ending sequence here. This is where you should end a fight. You don't need to really go for the choke. You want to make the choke appear, right? Let the choke happen by causing damage. The damage will make the choke appear. Look at damage, damage, punching, flatten them out, punch them, right? Now, watch how the neck just kind of appears. This guy wants out. There's the neck. Boom. Flattens him out, fights hands a little bit, punches his ear. Look, look at both this man's hands. None of them are fighting. None of them are peeling him off. He's done. He's over. And that's what we talk about when you, you don't want to win fights. You want to demoralize people, right? You, right. Want, you want to take it away from them, right? I want this man to think the next time an extreme couture name comes across his plate that he says, nah, man, I'm not going to fight one of those guys again. Like, yeah, that means I a think different. this was a beautiful fight for you to pick, not only because – of your connection and relationship with Dan, but also, you know, it's, and, and I shut up for the final sequence breakdown from you because even, and, I, and I'll credit you here as well, as you're talking about the breaking down and, and flattening them out, Michael Bisping was mentioning that on the broadcast and he was mentioning how it continued to happen. And, and it's, it's in these little moments for those who will watch or listen to this, it's in these moments I want you guys to understand what Coach Nixick is saying because it, as I played it back and, you know, full disclosure, when I talk to you, Coach, or any other people who will do this series with me, I'm not going to go back and watch these because I want to react in real time and I want to react and I want you to tell me what to look for. And it's, it's now when I see fighters working that ground and pound and working the flattening out position, where I'm going to look to see when that neck exposes itself because, and, and again, I'm doing this for my own specific reason, this series, but we can always bring it back. And, and I may not start getting the fans to hate me, but the casual fans, what is the last time you think a casual fan will point out someone just allowing another fighter to take their neck? It's going to be Nate Diaz, Conor McGregor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You and, know? um, uh, the one that stands out to me the most, and I'm dating myself, but it be, be, maybe because he's my coach, is Randy Couture. When Randy Couture fought Mike Van Arsdale going into round three, it was a very close round. And we talk a lot about body language. We talk about getting off the stool and how you present yourself to your opponent. A lot of that is just is this a poker face. And Randy got off that stool and started bouncing on his toes and looked over at the guy. And he said, when I did that, I knew it broke him. So Randy was able to win a lot of those transitions, um, flatten Mike out and, and choked him out. And he said, Randy will tell you the story, but he said, Mike basically just gave me his neck and said he wanted out, you know? So and it's, it's very important. Same thing, same thing Nate Diaz said, yeah. you know, the, the, the neck was there and Joe Rogan did a great job of explaining it, you know, and yes, obviously he has to add excitement, but he says he's got the choke before the choke's even in. For and, sure. and, and, and I know it seems like when I do these, and, and you've probably heard me say it a thousand times already in the month that we've been talking, but, you know, if I can do anything because I think fans look to Joe Rogan to be the voice, if I can be an echo of what he is saying in my own conversations and in these breakdowns, it's, I want fans to be able to be like, oh, I was listening to Inside the Cage or I watched Inside the Cage. And I know when guys are giving up their neck now. I know what positions cause guys to give up their neck. So Dan wins this fight by submission before we move on to the next fight. Just obviously you're happy. Uh, we saw you come into the cage, but it's contender series. You know, the, the, the show itself is just picking up steam. And as uh, the broadcast team goes over this replay, I'll just ask you, what's it like for you in this moment? And are you confident Dan's getting a contract? Um, I thought, well, I think we were the first fight of the night, if I remember correctly. Um, and then there was a lot of talent on that. Uh, I remember George Neal or uh, Jeff Neal on that card, I believe. Yeah. Alonzo Medif, like uh, Carl Robert. There, I mean, there are some killers that stacked. Um, stacked that are still in the UFC that are making noise. Like they're doing, they're doing really well. So um, what I was very happy with is I felt Dan showed 
all styles in this fight. He struck, he wrestled, he showed some jujitsu, he showed stamina, he showed heart. Um, I thought he showed the best all around game. It might not have been the biggest statement as you'll see maybe as the fights went on, like some guys, I think, I think a Minifield knocked the guy out or maybe it's Carl Robinson in like 15 seconds. That dude's getting a contract. You know, that's what they want to see. That's the whole point. But the, uh, what Dan was able to show all around, I thought was very important. Um, and that was a very, I mean, it, there was a lot of emotions involved because of it. And I remember just going in the back before we knew, and, and I have a really good picture. I'll try to repost it, but it's a, it's a picture of Dan laying on the mats and then myself like laying on the mat with him, like kind of holding his head. Because, I mean, after a fight, a lot of the people don't really understand the adrenal dump that happens, you know, the emotions that, that, that are involved. You know, you, you as a fan, um, you see 15 or 25 minutes of work at the most for these fighters, but you're talking about 18, or eight weeks of a camp, not only what everything else that they put into it. So there's a lot of emotions involved, and there was particularly in this fight, and uh, it was a great moment for the whole team. Yeah, I see that's actually part of – you know, my hope in this sport is bringing that emotion to the forefront of what, you know, fans are missing out on. And, you know, sometimes I'll ask a fighter or a coach something and they're like, why are you asking? Like, I never get asked that question. It's because it's in these moments, you know, I don't have to tell you, but it's in those moments of Francis Ngannou being at your house on a Friday night and you going, hey, if you want to take the day off. And he goes, no, coach, I see you at 11. Yeah. It's in those moments where you see who your fighters are and what they have and what they're made of. Um, great win there. And I think this is one of your most iconic moments as we move forward. Um, I'll, I'll give you some time to uh, – I believe it is – it's this fight, correct, where uh, we have the infamous third round. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Versad, yeah for sure. Yeah, so for, for sure. those and, – and we'll give a, a few moments here um, for everyone to kind of get gathered. Uh, we're going to go to Dan Ige and Mursad Bektik. Um, that, this recently, February yeah. uh, yep. of, of this year. Now, yeah. go ahead. Um, yeah, this would be – so uh, our first fight we get in the UFC was Julio Arce. Julio uh, beat us, uh, and he just – he outclassed us. And it was, a, it was a fight that I think Dan and I both needed. Um, because it, it helped me as a coach and it helped him as a fighter. And it was a good time in a weird way. It was a good time to get a loss. And that, that loss fired us up to, to, to no end. I mean, and, and now he's won five in a row. Um, and that, that loss in itself, I think, kind of was the, the catapult to, to getting our ass back to work and evolving our game. So I don't know if you heard this, but I told Dan this when he joined me on the show. Um, there's a, there's a backstory to when this five fight win streak, um, began for you guys uh, in Chicago yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and me being a narcissist, I, I got to bring it back to any connection I can for me. I remember I was going to do an interview with a fighter who wasn't on the card. He was just in town for one of his teammates. And, uh, unfortunately the UFC pulled him away to do some other stuff. So we couldn't do it, but I just remember walking through the hotel that day and it was the fighter hotel it was early morning before anyone went to the arena and i only saw two people outside of the fighter that i was supposed to see i saw robert whitaker's wife i wish her the best of luck and it scared the shit out of me because i didn't want her to go back to robert whitaker and be like this random guy that said good luck and yeah. i didn't need him coming out looking for me but i saw dan and you would have never thought dan was getting ready to go on a to go into a fight I think he yeah. was like, he came out of the uh, like printer area. He was grabbing some paperwork and uh, I just shook his hand and probably threw him off. So I was like, Hey, Dan, good luck. And he's like, thanks. But like yeah. totally out of the blue. And I, you know, I say this, or I say that to say this is that one of the first fighters to ever train me was Mike Santiago. Yeah. So it was a very, it was a very interesting and, and I, I, uh, ironic moment for I was like oh man like I, I definitely want to see Mike do well but now here we are what is that four years or two years later excuse me two years, yeah. um two years later and here I am talking to you guys so crazy uh little backstory just on the Santiago fight um you know we did our shakeout that morning and in Chicago at the hotel and I remember um us doing you know a, 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 a sequence and, and we bring uh Dan's brother Skyler in 
And Skyler's been so great and so pivotal to this entire run. I mean, if I can point at one thing that why we've been so good is actually bringing Skyler in, and he's helped us immensely. But um, Dan was doing the shakeout, and there was a sequence that Dan did. And I'll never forget this, and I, I swear to you to this day, you can ask Dan or Skyler. I look at Dan, I go, that's how you finish the fight. I go, I see it. That's what you need to do. This is how we're going to do it. Draw it out, and it's going to be there. And sure as shit, it was identical identical to the way we we did it i mean it's crazy how that stuff happens and a lot of that even shakeout stuff is is kind of a visualization drill to see yourself there and sure as shit that's exactly how dana finished that fight before we start this one because uh, we're gonna have to skip ahead because we get the bruce buffer intros um how how important is visualization in mixed martial arts i mean you can look up some of the most successful and high profile fighters uh, in the world and their little motivational videos on YouTube and the mixes that people put together from their interviews. But it's, you know, in, in football, you, you and I are both football guys. You know, we look at a quarterback and we go, wow, oh, the arm strength, wow, the arm strength. You never hear Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, even when they make these crazy, I'm in Jersey now and I know you have some ties here to Jersey. Yeah, my uncle was a huge Giants fan. If I, if, I, if I wanted to, I could show you all the pictures that are in his basement right now all these iconic Giants moments. But my point is, you don't hear Eli Manning say, oh, I visualized this moment of David Tyree going up and pinning the ball to his helmet in the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And David Tyree doesn't even say, I, I knew in my mind I could see it. I would pin a ball in my head. But in mixed martial arts, we hear fighters and, and coaches and, and everyone say, there's moments in these locker rooms. There's moments in training where – Either I as a coach said it or they as a fighter said, that's the, that's the thing. How, how important is visualization? I, I think you should do it every day. And, and I think you should spend time within your imagination uh, regularly throughout the day. And I, what, I, what I mean by that is you, you need to see yourself in a position that you're wanting to, the universe to accept, right? Um, Les Brown speaks about eyesight versus mindsight. Eyesight is what you can see and what you see in front of you. Mind side is what you can see for yourself, what you believe, you know? So, you know, I think it's important to visualize and see in that belt in your hand. There's a reason why I make all my guys after every, uh, after the rounds are over to, to walk with their hands up in the air, right? It's a, it's a, it's a muscle memory of visualization to see like, this is what happens when you win, right? Now I don't give a shit how dog tired you are. You're going to run with your hands in the air to show the judges, to show the crowd, that everybody that's invested in you, that you put all the work in, and that's part of the visualization drills that go on. I love it. And, I, and I'll get personal for a moment. You and I were talking yesterday before your dinner with Francis Ngannou, and it's crazy that we're talking about this because I literally – and you were the first person I think who understood what I was doing. You know, I, I'm, getting, I'm getting – I'm very fortunate. I've got great family here in Jersey who are looking out for me during this quarantine and allowing me to save up some money. And I'm getting close to my goal. Of, an, of getting my own, of where I want to be financially to get an apartment. And as I notice, I'm getting closer and closer. I've, I've found my location. I found my building. And the last few days, I take an hour of my day and I drive to this new neighborhood and I drive right to the complex and I just drive around and I drive around the neighborhood and it's exactly what you're talking about. And it's for the casual fans. It's why I've connected with MMA because mm -hmm. these, these lessons that you're teaching fighters can apply to everyday life. Everyday life, you know, um, when, when, you're, when you're doing things where, when, I don't care what the job is, right? Even if, you know, you're tested to become a firefighter, you know, do the things that they do on a day-to-day -day basis, dress like them, act like them, do the things that you're supposed to do and start seeing yourself into that mold, right? Same thing when you think about championship mindset, right? There's a reason why Coach Follis used to always say this. There's a reason why when you see a, a championship, a champion win the belt for the first time, why do they fall down on their knees and cry? Not because it was easy, right? It was, it took right. a lot, it took a lot to get there. It was a lot of sacrifice, you know, and it's part of visualizing and seeing yourself in those moments that are very special. Before we get this started, I'm queued up. I'm not sure if you're queued up. Yeah. Uh, um, the viral video, and it just got shared by the UFC recently. So I want to bring it up and uh, I know we have this fight and one more. And again, thank you for doing this. Um, who was behind the plan of having someone else in the gym hold a pad for, to take a Francis Ngannou kick? Oh, that was all me. So uh, <laughs> after, after uh, every practice, I hold, I hold kick shield uh, for both Brad and Francis. 
You know, um, it's just a little extra credit work. And same thing goes back into the mindset. The work is done, practice is over, but there's, there's guys that I, I, I want to make sure that they're doing just a little bit extra, especially when it comes to like your guy, your team captains, like Brad. When, when the other team guys see a guy like Brad doing just a little extra work, it makes them feel like they should do the same. So more and more without having to say anything, you're coaching in a way that you don't have to say a word, right? So what happens? You see guys go grab the kick shields and they do their own kicks and they do their own stuff after practice. So we were doing the kick shield stuff. We got done and I said, I grab my phone and I go, hey, Don, see if you can take a late kick from Francis. And Francis was like, no, nah, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. We're like, no, 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 do it. And then Don was the one that kind of egged him on. Don's like, yeah, 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 come on. And took his ass right off his feet, you know? So that was, it was amazing, man. It was so funny. So I know I'm not going to have any say in not coming to the gym and at least jumping in and some type of workout when I do come to Vegas. For sure. But I don't, I don't have to be, I don't have to hold a, a kick shield for Francis, do I? No, no, you don't want to do that. <laughs> I, I don't have health insurance right now. I don't know if I'll ever get it if I have one leg decapitated from my body. Um, but that's, that's great. And that's, again, this is part of the, the idea behind this stuff is to bring up those moments. Again, what are all these things, and, and not to plug, you know, my concept here, but all these things we're discussing is exactly the title behind the show. It's, it's why it's inside the cage. Yeah, I got it, man. If these fighters aren't grabbing those kick shields, are they going as hard in those final 30 seconds or, or whatever the case may be? So here we are, UFC 247, big card, John Jones fighting, uh, I think, two title fights that night, Valentina Shevchenko, Caitlin Chukagian, John Jones, Dominic Reyes. You're in Texas. Texas is Texas. Yeah. Uh, let, let's kind of set the scene before we start the fight. Uh, Dan, where was he was in the he was on a four fight win streak on, at this point. Um, this, this is huge. Uh, you know, four fights usually mean a lot in your UFC career, uh, mm -hmm. especially after signing a contender series contract and losing your first fight. I'm, I'm sure the UFC matchmakers are like, holy hell. Wait, OK, this guy's on a four fight win streak. What's the mindset like heading into this fight? Um. We, we, I, you know, we knew that we, we didn't have to say much about uh, the gravity of what, was, what the fight meant. Um, we had all the respect in the world for uh, Mursad and his camp. We knew that this guy was going to be our best test. Uh, but we, we, we knew there was a path, a path to victory there. So we were very confident, but we also uh, knew that we had holes we needed to fix because those holes were going to get exploited. So there was, a, there was a little bit of chess match going on, I think, between myself and Faraz. Um, and then, and then knowing, knowing your fighter, I knew I, I, had a, I had a little bit of a backstage idea of what I was going to get out of Mursad and what we needed to uh, implement right away in round one. Uh, the whole tone of the week lit a fire under our ass, to be quite honest with you, because we were the afterthought of Mursad Bektik. It was how Mursad Bektik is going to make a comeback on Danny Gay's name, how Mursad Bektik is going to expose these holes in X, Y, and Z, or, you know, how coaching against uh, Faraz was out of my element, all this bullshit, everything that you could possibly hear was fueled to the fire, man. And, and it, lit, it lit a fire under our ass and we wanted to go out and prove a point. And, and before we start, it's another thing you just mentioned, Faraz Sahabi, well-respected coach. You are a well-respected coach. But again, if we relate it to other sports, you know, when I'm trying to think of two iconic football coaches currently going right now. Oh, let's just say Andy Reid and uh, Bill Belichick, two very re respected coaches in the NFL. When they go head to head, we do we could get a whole segment just on the coaches. Mm -hmm. I think in MMA, especially in the UFC, we'll we'll hear about how smart and how professional certain coaches are. And what they're, what they're known for inside their gyms. Oh, this coach teaches this technique and this. But from maybe a question you don't get asked a lot, I don't know if you've ever gotten asked this question, how much from a coaching standpoint do you go, I'm coaching against – you're coaching your fighter, but I'm coaching against that coach? Um, you, you, could, you could draw a lot off of styles and um, almost uh, – um, their theories, I think you would, you could say, I mean, it's pretty easy to, to guess like at extreme couture, what you're going to get out of an extreme couture fighter being a Randy couture gym, uh, team quest lineage, things of that sort. So, I mean, a lot of our guys are, are built like that, but you know, you start looking at, at the evolution of the sport and a guy like Francis Ngannou is not going to really fit that, 
uh, Randy Couture's style, right? So right. It, it's it's a matter of I think taking the best attributes that your fighter might have. How do you sprinkle in some new new ideas and thoughts and really amplify what they're really good at? But at the core of that whole situation is is uh, the the ethics and the roots of what you are as a team and as a gym and how you build the mental side of stuff, right? The skill set's a skill set. You can build on those things, but at the bottom at the bottom layer of that is is really the depth of that cake right like you have to be able to instill the standard you know showing up on time all those little things that really like oh, that doesn't that doesn't win makes wins and losses it does it adds up so being accountable showing self accountability and how you want to get better all those things are very important i think uh you know the, the certain gyms and certain teams like i look at like when i fight a uh, mark montoya's guys i know these guys are going to be freaking on their game man you know, for as a hobby, same thing, you know, you, there's some, there's some great coaches out there um, and they're, and they throw some curveballs your way and you just got to be ready to adapt. I got to ask before we start, what's with the hat? You like that? I, I was, I was waiting for a while. Um, I, I wanted to make sure I was reading it correctly. Did you get that custom made? No, one of my buddies sent it out, but I, I love, so you got the Wi-Fi. you got a very <laughs> popular porn site. Uh, that's a virus survivor. You got Perel. You had a, a toilet paper roll and an empty toilet paper roll. So I thought, that, it, was a, I thought it was a great hat, man. <laughs> that is hilarious. We can get more into, uh, you know, fights being shut down before the third fight. But now we've got Mursad Bechik and Dan Ige, UFC 247. Kerry Hatley is our referee. I don't know if you knew much about him coming in. Yep, I had him a few times. So and as you, said, you see Dan, Dan's dad right behind him. Dan's dad is a master chief in the Navy SEALs. Uh, he's been in the, uh, the Navy SEAL for over 30 years, uh, team three guy. Uh, one of the, one of the, I mean, just an unbelievable man to be around. Uh, you, you talk about being able to pick somebody's brain at the highest level. That's the man to talk to. He's, he's, he's unreal. And, and there's a big reason why Dan Ige is the fighter he is today. It's a lot to do with his dad and what he's instilled in him. See, this is exactly why. You're, you're going to be annoyed with me forever because we, we just connect on, on a different level than I love it, man. This is what it's about. <laughs> all right. We're just, I'm at uh, about 420 here. Don't get too excited for all you potheads out there, but um, a, a wild flurry to start. It, it seems that it, it's the go-to for Danny Gay to start fights. Oh yeah. So we're, we're looking to set a tone. And let's look back and, and think about here, here we are, our um, sixth fight in the UFC versus the contender series. Watch Dan's cage control. Look at where Bechtick's at in the ring, in the octagon. We call those two black lines, those two black lines around the octagon, we call that the red zone. And I want to keep guys in that red zone. So we occupy center. Every time he moves, uh, we use the ge basic, basic geometry with the cage you step 45 degree angles and you're always staying in front of them at range. Now, Bechtick threw a kick, <clears throat> excuse me, threw a kick and uh, got on his back, fell on his back here. I'm at 325. Um, and then a wild flurry directly after that. When a guy slips like that, but you get position, what is your mindset as a coach for your fighters? Well, we always teach when guys throw knees, um, if they're not framing or they don't have wrist control to, to knee tap or to use that to, for a takedown, and that's exactly what Dan did there. Um, again, it's just – it's not a fight ending sequence. We knew that, but it's a free, it's a free couple punches there. So anytime we can maybe cut a guy or, uh, or, or you know, reel, reel off a good, a good shot there while the guy's getting up, you got to make him pay. So I'm at 250. We got, we're getting crazy flurries here. How are you feeling – in the beginning of this fight. Love it. We're, I mean, so, so my assessment of Mursad Bektik was, a, was, and I'm not saying this to be rude to Mursad, but he has a bully mentality. If Mursad is, is bullying the guy or it's going his way, then he's, he's really showing out. But once you kind of take that bully out of it, element out of him saying, hey, motherfucker, we're here for a scrap, um, you watch him. I mean, that's what happened in the Darren Elkins fight. He couldn't put Darren away. He gassed out and then he got put away. So right away, round one, this is what we wanted to do. We want to implement our dominance and say, look, motherfucker, you're not here to, you're not going to do shit to us. We're going to fuck you up right here in the first round and you're in for a dog fight. And, and it absolutely has been, I've got two minutes left on my clock and, and it's one thing, the red zone aspect that you were talking about, 
think a lot of fans will only recognize that area when the fighter's back is completely up against the cage. But there's still a few feet in between the red zone beginning and the cage. How can fighters like Dan utilize that, we'll call it eight, nine, ten feet uh, of space in the red zone? So we know that he has nowhere else to back up. He has, he has a, Rasad has a step, maybe a step and a half to back up. So right now we're prodding. So watch, Dan's, Dan uh, showed a switch cross. He's showing level changes. I mean, this is be beautiful out of Dan Ige. And you can just see the evolution in his striking game from contender series to here. Uh, you know, Rasad goes in for a shot. He has a lead arm frame, frames off the ear. He throws a kick, Dan's countering. And look, reestablish the center again. I'm about at the 110 mark. And look at, I mean, Dan is just really occupying that space and making Rasad think. And every time Rasad comes forward, Dan can half beat, which he did, half beat. Uh, now he's back in on the counter. Half beat, miss, the kick misses, right? So you have a, a luxury of being able to move in and out where Rasad doesn't. He has a cage right behind him. So that is 90% that is of our game plan, ladies and gentlemen. I'm giving it to you live here is I want to put motherfuckers back up to the cage. And I want to show this faint level change, and we want to be able to make them feel, uh, fight under duress. And, and giving game plans and, and thoughts are one thing, but it's all about the skill sets and, and going out and executing. So I, I, I kind of like that when, when coaches and fighters open up because it's more so of a, hey, this is what we're going to do. We have to go execute it, and you have to stop our execution. Um, hey, I used to love watching Roger Clemens. He would get on the mound, and he would do this, right? He would, yeah. he would look at the batter and fucking tell him it's a fastball, motherfucker. Try to hit it. <laughs> <laughs> End of round one here for me. A wild, uh, you know, very uh, hectic round one. And uh, before we go to kind of the corner conversation, one thing I wanted to ask in the beginning and I didn't is, what's the immediate differences? And did you and Dan talk about, obviously he had a few fights in the UFC, but he's now on this card as you, uh, you know, pay-per-view card. And as you said, people are using him as kind of a stepping stone for Bectic's comeback, but this isn't contender series. And, and if you can maybe talk about the differences from the first fight we broke down of Dan to this one and the atmosphere around it. Um, almost tunnel vision, you know, it was our, I think it was our first pay-per-view and uh, we did, we didn't put a lot of investment into it, you know, and uh, as, as a matter of fact, I'm very big on telling Dan, I oh, and this has come, this came from my dad. Um, my dad, you know, he was, he's a phenomenal football coach, but I remember one time him telling me uh, when we were cornered to fight at the MGM Grand, he's like, hey, do you ever take a second and take it all in? And I was like, nah, I never really do. I just kind of focus on the task at hand. And he goes, he goes, man, like, and I'll never forget this. He goes, what are you, what are you going to remember to tell your kids about in those moments? Right. And I remember that same day I cornered that fight at the MGM. Brad Favars is fighting Nate Marcourt. And I remember just taking a second. There's a moment or two there where you have, a, you have a second. And I remember stopping and just looking around and taking it all in. It didn't add any extra pressure to me. It actually took a little bit off. It made me happy to be there, man. Like I was like, man, we're so blessed to be here. So that moment I remember telling Dan, I said, hey, we're going to be in blue corner. When we get into the cage, I'm going to have water for you. But I go, I want you to take a minute and take it all in, bro. Like you, I want you to remember how far you've came from contender series, fighting on the regional show, you're fighting on a pay-per-view card. And it, and it worked, man. Like it, it really, it really, I think, I think it helped energize the kid a lot. So round one is clearly Dan's, uh, I think, in everybody's yeah. mind. There's no doubt about that. Um, how does this corner conversation go here? Um, you know, so Dan's very, very vocal about it, myself as well, that we've dropped round twos in the past. Um, I kind of felt the way round one went. I was, I was, it was a little bit of cat and mouse game. I was, I was thinking to myself, well, I wonder if Faraz let us kind of blow a little bit of our energy and, and almost rope a dope in round one. And he's going to come out in round two and wrestle. Um, and that's what I told Dan. I said, Hey, look, I need you to make sure you're sitting down on your punches. You're framing off, which you did great in round one. We, we established a frame, meaning we weren't wrestling from chest to chest. Framing is one layer, first layer of defense is keeping them off your chest. And then you have the chest and the wrestling from that on out. 
but you, a lot of people miss the framing part and that's one big uh, defensive side of things so I want to make sure that Dan's not overthrowing his punch and he's sitting down and he's and he's getting that frame in all right I'm getting ready here for round two as uh the camera is showing a nice lady for Modelo I mm -hmm. didn't ask what it, what is your beverage of choice this evening uh, I grab whatever's in the fridge, but it's a little too fruity for me. Uh, it's a cider. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a little. I'm gonna have a I'm gonna have a headache after drinking this thing. But uh, if it makes I'll, you feel any better, I I go domestic, but I've got Bud Light Platinum. And, nice. But it's like, and, and I couldn't realize this the first few times I had them. So I am a, I'm very John Morgan esque, where I'm good with a Miller or a Budweiser or yeah. a Coors Light, uh, as he enjoys. But it was. Like, I started drinking Bud Light Platinum a little bit more, and I was waking up with headaches. And I'm like, dude, it's not because there's 6% alcohol in these domestic beers. There's no way. Right. And uh, I, I won't say what else I drink, but uh, I'll just say <laughs> there, there, there is a fighter uh, who promotes what I drink. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm like, God, it, it's got to be because I drink that afterwards or beforehand, you know, because I'm mixing. And then one day I was like, I'll just drink the Platinums and see how I – and I'm like, no, there's no way. And, it, and it's actually what's happening. So yeah. I get a lot of shit for, your, for drinking Bud Light Platinums, but gets the well, job done. Watching this fight, as you can see, my, my cussing started to come up a lot more. I'm going uh, to call downstairs and order a Jameson ginger ale here in a minute. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, I'm starting round two now. If All right, ready. let's go. Yep, let's rock. So again, uh, you know, big, big on, I'm, I'm very big on cage control. You know, um, you'll see that a lot. And right away, here's, here's Dan establishing the cage control. I think Rasad's coming out with a little bit more urgency as you see here. But again, a lot of that urgency is, I think, is to draw Dan into a firefight. Now looking back at it to change levels, which he did a great job with. There it is. Back to get Dan up against the cage here. There's scores a, good... a takedown, but a beautiful sprawl. Well, now they're just both sprawling. Dan's got his feet on the cage here. About the 425 mark. Well, I'm at 420 now. Um, what does having your feet on the cage like that do? Obviously, you could push off and, and all that, mm -hmm. but does it also provide some sense of, like, I know I have an escape route? Yeah, it lets you know where you're at, but you you nailed it. First thing is, uh, you know, if 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 I'm if I'm in Bechtick's corner, I'm yelling at Bechtick to pull his feet off that cage, you know, because that's a that's a great pivot point to push off and try to be, be, do a big bridge. So yeah, he did a good job of pulling the feet off the cage. Now Dan Dan is kind of a uh, almost just stall. This is a good stall position. He could use his left arm to push uh, to push uh, Mursad's head between his legs and go for an inverted triangle. Uh, probably wouldn't have been successful, but it's something to really scale a guy down or uh, slow, slow a guy down. And that's what Dan's doing. He should be digging a little bit of underhooks here. He needs to get his right knee to the ground. He needs to get to his right hip or excuse me, left. Yep. And then try to get that knee to the ground. Right, right knee. Yep, I was right. And that's what he needs to try to build a base off of. And back to here now trying to climb Dan's back. Dan's not allowing him to do so. Yep, which is a great adjustment by Bechtick there is what you want to do is threaten the neck because of what it does is establishes Dan to have to check the, check the hands. So he did a great job with that. He's uh, stepping over the leg. I mean, this is just, just – I mean, Bechtick's an awesome wrestler as it is anyway. Uh, so is Dan. You know, look at Dan trying to create scrambles. He's hooking the leg. Um, I'm, not, I'm not too nervous here because we're not, we're not uh, getting damaged by any means, but Bechtick is winning this round. With the time left in the round, if we can get a reversal here, I'd be confident in Dan striking to be able to sway the judges back to our side. But we have to, we have to start pushing here, you know? Now, for those who listen to our first fight breakdown when we talk about wrestling, and you know, Mursad's not doing the, the most damage, but he's having the control. So maybe if you can speak on the difference between those two. I'm at 220 here. Uh, we can keep it rolling. Um, it's smothering. The, it's just uh, smothering. It's a smother. It's a wet blanket. Uh, now, this is something that I saw on the tape with Mursad was his head arm choke. So I, I seen him setting it up earlier. Um, and this is something I'm screaming at Dan to get his arm back down and repummel. Here is hard because you can't shrimp. Usually my defense is, the, is a good shrimp. And then to, to almost kind of pummel my arm back under the head. Uh, Mursad did a good job taking that away. I'm screaming right now to get his uh, hand inside his uh, uh, crook of his elbow to make a frame. 
So I want Dan to get that left hand and start framing on his elbow to help. But Dan's a black belt. He, you know, he rolls with some of the best guys in the world uh, on a constant level. He's been here before. This is a lot, honestly, this is a lot of matter of just uh, self perseverance here and knowing that you're okay. As, now we, as a coach, knowing, you know, with Dan knowing he's okay because of his background that you just mentioned. Um, and, and I know you said you're screaming at this point, but a lot of action in this round from Bectic, but not as much damage. Yes, the smothering is happening, but what's going through your mind? Like, yeah, all right, this round's not going our way, but I don't know that my fighter is really compromising his, himself in, in this round. Yeah, it's just a matter of now there was so much time on the clock when he had this, uh, this choke set in this is going to go one or two ways. Either we're going to get out or this, uh, he was going to finish us. But, but by us getting out, I felt this guy was going to burn his arms out, you know? So, I mean, it was this, there's so much time left while, while he had that choke in. I was, man, I was, I was like, oh shit. You know, I was scared, man, to be honest with you here. I mean, this, these elbows that he's throwing are pointless. I'm yelling at Dan just to start pummeling, but this is a lost round. This round is not, this round is not going to go our way. Now, unless you get up and knock the dude out and the chances right. of that happening, calculated risk are very slim. So we're almost better off just maintaining control and not allowing any more damage here. So here I would just recommend to crowd the head, um, basically S grip around the back and, and, and just hold the guy down because now it's a matter of focusing on breathing and rearing up for round three. So round two ends. I believe Bektik will end up with more than four minutes or just about four minutes of top control in this round. But, and we can get into what it, what it is and we can stop it here um, for your moment. Um, but uh, does that constitute a 10-8 if there's not, their control is there, but the damage is not? No damage. No, no, nothing there led to a fight ending sequence. So um, to argue a 10-8 or even, even bring up a 10-8 is absolutely rubbish. I mean, it's just fucking stupid to even bring that up. He, 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 had a, he had a head arm choke that Kerry Hatley obviously had the best angle, and it, it, wasn't even, it wasn't even a threat to where Dan thought he would tap. There was absolutely no elbows. There was no damage. He wasn't dropped. Nothing, nothing. So to constitute a 10-8 that round would be a fucking rookie shit. Also be a Texas thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah would, no shit. It, it, it would be a Texas thing. All right, so yeah. here we have, and uh, I'll kind of play it, um, but uh, this is a, a very – incredible moment between you and Dan and uh I I know that the masses want to say certain things about coaches and what they say to their fighters but you had a very intense moment with Dan if you want to just reflect on this moment oh man it was it was just it was very organic you know and it was funny because when uh it got reposted I think Brian Butler posted it first Dan's manager I joked like the anchor man, like, or, uh, or excuse me, old school with Will Ferrell after he debated, he's like, I blacked out. I don't know what the hell I said. You know, like, I don't know, <laughs> yeah. I don't know what happened. Um, and I, I really, honestly, God, I, I had to go back and look at it. And uh, the, the nice thing about having uh, Will Harris is one of your good friends, anatomy of a fighter, shout out to him. Uh, he's in our gym quite a bit. And, and Will has been a part of, of myself and Dan's growth since day one. So we have video footage and, things that we've done for so many years that I'm going to be able to share with my children one day that I think has just been an immense uh, thing for us in, that we have. And, and, and uh, Will came in and, to one of our Saturday practices and actually caught somewhat of this, this moment here where we talk about that. Every time we go into round three, I say to him, I say, Hey, round three, what are we going to do here? And he said, fuck them up or 10, eight, you know, and we just got the fuck them up part out. So I was, I was happy about that. <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. And, and you know, I, and, I, I got to say, big shout out to Will Harris. He he is someone that uh, I know he, his star blew up when he went on Rogan's show. And again, I don't speak for Joe, but I think Joe and I have a similar mindset of you need to be able to tell the stories of, of these fighters and those involved in this sport. And I think Will does a fantastic job of doing that. Unbelievable talent. His turnaround time is unreal. Like he'll come to the gym and have something and then he'll send me a video in, in an hour, an hour and a half. And it's like, it's like an Oscar award winning, you know, like, dude, how the hell did you do this? You know, it's like, he should, the guy should get an Emmy. Uh, but moreover, he's actually a really good dude, you know, and, and he's a fly on the wall. He doesn't, um, he doesn't overstep his bounds. He knows what he's supposed to do and, and he does a great job doing it. 
Um, going into the corner here, uh, I remember Dan specifically telling me, and I kind of chuckled at it because he got up and he goes, huh, yeah, guy burned his arms out. Like, he almost was <laughs> like, 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 because he knew I was going to fucking yell at him. But he was like, oh, I knew what I was doing there. I, I, I think I was going to burn his arms out. So it was, I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I go, yeah, I know, or something like that right off the bat. So it was pretty funny. That's awesome. All right, I am beginning round three here. Um, obviously, both guys tired, you know, from, from Betzik tiring his arms out, but Dan also having to have him on top for over four minutes in the second round. But all fights start on the feet, and all, all rounds start on the feet. Yeah, and you got to think, too, where – momentum's got to swing a little bit in our favor to think that, you know, Mursad, uh had, had uh, Dan's best, uh, best number pulled there and he couldn't finish. So right now this is, uh, this is probably the most aggressive I've seen Dan Ige and the fact of like emotional, I should say, not aggressive. He, Dan's actually talking shit to him now. Really? Dan's calling him a bitch. Um, you know, <laughs> at one point Faraz yells one, one, two. And Dan hits him with a one-one-two, and he goes, "There, bitch! I'm throwing what your fucking coach is telling you to throw." <laughs> you know, um, during the media day, Mursad took his shirt off at media day, and Dan goes, "Yeah, take your shirt off now, bitch!" And kept like slamming him with body shots. So I've never seen Dan that emotional. But again, it was kind of like just that that bully element when you start to uh, when you start to to get a bully and you start to cower that bully down, they fucking fold. It's the, uh, it's the Kevin Garnett. I believe it was Kevin Garnett um, and his famous uh, speech is knock the bully ass out. Knock that uh, bully out, you know? Yeah. I think he said that in, uh, when the Celtics won the championship when he won his first title. Mm-hmm. He said, I knock the bully's ass out. Uh, it's that funny that you bring out. that up, though, as we hit 3.30 here on the clock. Uh, because when you're watching these fights, uh, unless it's very animated, it, it's hard to point out when the trash talking is actually taking place. Right. Yeah. Oh, it, it was good too. Like it was, some of it was right in front of our corner. So I was able to hear him and it actually fired us up as coaches and, and Dan's dad, you know, like, cause, cause Dan was not having it. And I, I was, I was so proud of him cause he's very calm. You talked to Dan before he's very soft spoken. Yeah. Uh, this, there was a lot of fire, a lot of fire under his ass there. So we're just uh, over two minutes into the third round. The referee gives us a separation here. How, now, you you see Dan here. He's like, yo, I'm ready to go. Uh, what are you thinking in that moment? I love it because uh, I want you to think about, again, like cosmetically and, and, and aesthetically what the judges are looking at, right? Yeah, this, yeah. This, this, is, this, is, this is politicking right now. Um, you know, Coach Falls used to always kind of have us run drills too where like if, if the guy's backing up, you fucking like Max Holloway, like let's go. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that is, again, it's politicking. You're, you're telling him like, man, I'm ready to fight and you're not like, let's fucking get after this shit. And that's what he's yelling at him right now. You can see his mouth moving. He's like, come on, bitch. You're right there. <laughs> you, you see him at, at like the four fifteen mark. He's coming. Let's go, bitch. Oh, this is great. Yeah. Yeah. He's signaling towards him to step in around. Uh, I'm, I've got two minutes left here on my clock. And this has got to be where even if the damage isn't, you know, Mursad's not rocked, he, he's not getting dropped, but compare that to the, you know, top position for over three minutes, it's, it's a different feel for the judges, for the fans, for coaches, where you're, where you're saying, listen, we're, we're where we need to be in this fight. Yeah, and that, there's a switch cross, switch cross with the kick. Yes. Switch cross, uh, the hook is to turn the shoulder, and then he adds the body kick. So, I mean, what we're doing aesthetically for the judges, I think, is just uh, we're going to win this fight. So, um, Mursad scores this last-ditch attempt, takedown, 90 seconds left. But uh, for the fans, I want you to watch Mursad and see how much damage he gets off in this time. Watch how many punches Dan throws versus Mursad. Yes, Mursad is controlling the position. Um, we're about the minute five mark. Dan, here's Dan punching. You know, it's probably not the best location to the back of the neck, but um, – <laughs> But I mean, he's staying busy now. Watch Mursad. Uh, this, this, honest to God, I mean, I don't want to be rude, but I mean, this is this to me is Mursad holding on for dear life because Dan's putting the fucking hands on him in round three. And at this point, for for Mursad or for any fighter in this position, you just want to make it to the bell. Yeah. If you're if you're if you feel you're compromised in the round. 
Yep, he's landed zero strikes, Bektik, in this whole in this whole ground attempt situation here. There's been zero strikes. He is controlling the position. Um, you know, here I'm just yelling at Dan to sit out to do to create a scramble. You know, end and up on top. He's still getting shots off. He's getting an elbow off here with about ten seconds. Yeah, he's still working, but really not much of anything from Bektik in this third and final round. And yep. uh, as the horn sounds, how are you feeling? I, I think we got it. You know, uh, I wasn't even worried about some of this, the weird, the weird decisions, the way the, the, the judges were. Um, I looked at a, I looked at a guy who threw more significant strikes, who moved uh, the, 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 his opponent back the entire time. And I looked at Mursad scoring a takedown that looked more out of, uh, out of duress. He didn't want to get fucking hit anymore. You know, I think Dan landed um, 13, 13, yeah, four, 15 significant strikes. That's in round three. So 15 significant strikes versus four in round three, right? There's a tail right. tape right there. That's it. The guy, the, you know, he, he, uh, he uh, doubled, almost tripled it. So then we see, uh, you know, we go to the judges' scorecards. They ruled a split decision. A win is a win, but are you frustrated in this moment with, with everything? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, you know, I, I, I know I'm, I'm frustrated with the round twos, you know, uh, and I, I think that, that to me is uh, as a coaching element that I need to be better at. I think I'm focusing too much on dominating and winning a round three, and I need to emphasize more on round twos. So as a coach, I think I need to go back to the drawing board um, and be better tactically on how to get my fighter to respond in round twos. Uh, I don't like hearing Dan say in the end here, he said, hey, you know, the blueprint's out there to beat me round two, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we talk about visualization and uh, how, how you speak about things. You say things, you say things and that puts things in motion. Uh, and I, and when, I, when I heard him say that, that made me uh, frustrated as a coach, not at Dan, as a coach. I need to be better at feeding him the right information on round twos aren't, aren't uh, the rounds we're going to drop anymore. Round twos are the front rounds we're going to put fuckers away now. Well, uh, it, it's great to kind of chronicle where and, and how uh, Dan has grown in his game from that contender series fight to, you know, the most recent win now on a five fight win streak. Coach, you picked out this last one. And uh, some people might go, what? I mean, you picked out all three, but some people may be like, why, why is he choosing to do this? And I want to credit you and compliment you on, on choosing to go this route um, as I buy you some time to, to cue it up here. But, yeah, uh, it up. yeah. Um, in this fight that we're about to break down with you, it's Brad Tavares against Israel Adesanya. At the time, Brad Tavares ranked – eighth and I believe this is Izzy's third fight in the UFC and uh you know it's it's a big deal and, and one thing you know we'll talk about this fight as it goes along and I'll ask you a couple questions leading into it but um you know one thing I want to look at also if you are willing is the growth of having coached uh, against an Israel Adesanya in this fight to the guy that we're seeing now mm -hmm. and, and and obviously paying all respects to Brad, and, and this is the main event of this fight. So in the lead-up to it, what is it like for you heading into this fight? You know, so it, this this role for me uh, being in Brad's corner, um, yes, my title is coach. Ray Seffo is the head coach. But my role is very different for Brad. My role is a lot of um, uh, training partner stuff, but I, I really want to make sure that – I'm kind of putting a bow on everything that coach Cepho has. So my, my role now is a little bit more of a support role rather than as a head coach. Um, I think all coaches should understand the way the pecking order of a corner goes. If you are not the head coach, you need to adhere to what the head coach needs and what he wants, right? You shouldn't overstep your bounds. You shouldn't step on toes. You can bring up ideas and thoughts, but I think that's what makes my corner with coach Ray very good is that, you know, we have a good open line of communication, um, but we're also understanding our roles and what, what he wants out of us. So uh, this particular camp, you know, I, to be quite honest with you, is the best I've ever seen Brad look. I mean, it was unbelievable. Everybody in our gym was like, holy shit, like I've never seen Brad look this good. And I think that's, um, uh, you know, a lot of credit to how good Israel is. 
you think guys like Israel coming in with a big hype that instead of thinking, you know, you, cause you just mentioned how good Brad looked, but for fighters, have you ever had these conversations of, Hey, we're going up against, not, not, let's not say a hype train. Cause Izzy, I think has proven he's more than a hype train, but we're going up against a guy who has a lot at stake behind him. You know, there's a lot of chips in his favor. If these things go his way, and we've talked about visualization. We've talked about knowing your fighters why. But how do you check this part with your fighters? Hey, 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 you're not only the underdog, but there's not as much emotional and promotional investment in you in this fight. How do you handle that? Um, I, it, it, was, it was a great – it's a great point by you, and I think it was something that we try to feed off of a little bit. It was almost the, the, the disrespect. Um, we – we felt that it, I wouldn't say it was it was disrespectful by the UFC by any means. They're giving Brad the opportunity uh, to fight in a main event, and I think this was the this was the perfect test to see what they had in Israel, but this is also the perfect test to see what they had in Brad. You know, here's Brad number eight in the middleweight division. We're coming off of three wins in a row. Um, his last win by a knockout of Christoph Jocko. So Brad's got a lot of momentum riding too. So I think where they matched this fight up was was very perfect in both men's trajectory of their careers. How did you feel about Israel Adesanya coming into this one? Well, um, you know, being from New Zealand um, or where he trains, uh, we we knew with Ray and Coach Sefo, like Ray, we knew a lot of their camp and their and their their coaches. So it was almost kind of like uh, Doug Vinny and a lot of those guys over at uh, City Boxing. So we knew a lot about Israel and, and his kickboxing accolades. So what we wanted to do was uh, obviously we wanted to implement a full MMA game plan. We wanted to make sure this guy could, uh, could wrestle with us and had ground game and we didn't want to stand there and, and just get turned into a kickboxing match, you know, where, um, where I think that's where we wanted to put the fight was, was not on the ground, but we wanted him to make sure that the ground game was going to be available for us. So I'm just going ahead and skipping through the intros here. The great Bruce doing that. I will let you know as I am queued up. I'm queued up, ready to go. If you are. Yep, good to go. Awesome. So we'll start off here. It is the main event of the Tough 27 finale. Brad Tavares, Israel, Adesanya, the last style bender. People may not recognize him because his hair is so short. Yeah, this is a home game for us. You know, this is yeah. our this is our entire gym. Uh, the entire Hawaiian population is there. You know, like it's it's a home game for us, and it's a small, intimate setting. Again, this is at the uh, Pearl. Do you like having your guys fight or fight in smaller crowds? Just depends. You know, um, yeah, it just depends. I'm not a big fan of the Pearl because you don't really have much room to work as a corner. It sounds weird, but like everybody's on top of you almost to the point where one of our cornermen, uh, uh, Devin, was actually sitting in uh, a different seat. He wasn't even behind us. They had a move. Really? Yeah, so. But about the 420 mark, I'm at 410 right now. But about Perfect. 420, Brad lands a big overhand right. Now he's got Izzy pressed up against the cage. Not much happening, but he's got him up against the cage. And then as Izzy breaks, Brad hits him with another right. Yeah. How would you so break down this first minute? So Brad's underhook um, heads positions on the wrong side of the underhook, and then he moves ahead, and then Izzy breaks off, and then throws the right hand. Um, I like what Brad's doing. He's he's again. We're talking about cage control, where you want to limit a guy who is very good in movement. You want to limit his his movement by cutting off the cage. So allowing taking away some of his exit points. It's very imperative with a guy like Israel. You have to back him up, you know. But Israel does really really good at using. Look at his feints. Watch him. Watch his knee. Very subtle. Very subtle. Right? So he's doing a very good job of, of fainting and collecting data. And uh, I'm at about 315, but I want to say maybe about 345. He does something that, and I've noticed he, that he does it a lot. I think you saw it a lot in the uh, Anderson Silva fight. He almost like shoots from the hip. He, he, he does a lot of hip thrusting to, mm -hmm. as part of his feint. Mm -hmm. Maybe just from a coaching standpoint, you could talk about what just kind of that hip motion that hip faint does for fighters. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's showing the fact that you have a knee available. So if you're looking to shoot, he's showing you that, Hey, there's a knee here for you. So the hip faint, or if he lifts the leg up or the knee, he's just kind of letting you know that it's out there and, and, uh, and possibly timing it. So a lot of the hip faints you'll see um, 
go hand in hand with a guy level changing. If guy level changes, you'll see a guy feign a knee. So that's uh, it's important to know that it's there. That's a nice body kick by Israel out of the open stance, slides the open stance, throws the body kick. Two big things here I'm noticing in this round from Izzy, and, and maybe you can talk how you were coaching up against this. He's doing the uh, – not not necessarily the rubber. He's showing his backhand a lot. He's throwing it up in the air, spinning it in a circle, um, and he's throwing a lot of low kicks. How, how do you adjust to this, what he's doing in this first round? Um, well, we're staying in kick range. So we need to either be all the way out or all the way in. So we're, 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 we're right at, at Izzy's range, and we're just outside of Brad's range. So you see Brad missing. And you see Izzy connecting. And again, that has to do with Israel's length and his, his use of uh, his footwork. So watch, watch him how he creeps in and out, right? So a lot of the feints that he's showing are blinding you by uh, smoke and mirrors. He's, he's, he's reeling his hand around, but meanwhile, he's closing distance with his feet. So it's just, it's just genius. You know, we go on the single leg. This is what we wanted to do a lot more of. We wanted to be on the single leg, and he, and he did a good job of defending it. And then he did that thing that you said you talk about. He pointed to the middle. And yeah. obviously, it takes away the cage control from Brad. But does that set a tone for you? Uh, and you being in the opposite corner, does that kind of make you have to change your game plan? Not yet. Nothing, nothing yet. Um, especially when you have the luxury of a five-round fight. Uh, I think this is, uh, this is a good, I wouldn't say a feeling out round. I mean, Israel's winning this round. And uh, I think the adjustments need to be made properly and getting, get them on the stool and see what we have to do to adjust. But uh, not, nothing, too, nothing too worrisome yet. Now, I'm at 40 seconds here. And you, you kind of talk about, you know, just get him on the stool. And I'm not saying you or any of the pro-level coaches ever do this, but is there ever a point in a round where you're just like, let's just get to the end of the round because then we can make the adjustments that will help us win this fight? Yeah, it happens. It happens quite a bit. Um, uh, the Christoph Jocko Uriah Hall fight, for example, um, you know, we, we that was a ten eight round for Jocko, and it was just like, hey, let's just get this guy on the stool and, and you know survive this round. You know, this this was not that desperate to me. Right, uh, this, right. This this was just say, hey, man, let's get him on the stool and 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 re and really, uh, I want an idea of what Brad's seeing, how he's feeling, what he's seeing. So in that in those last ten seconds, we saw. If you could take us through that last sequence there when Izzy rolls, just kind of let everyone know what happens there in that final 10 seconds. Uh, let me back it up. So it looks like he goes for an MNR roll. Just almost just kind of what we talked about in some of the earlier fights was uh, he's just showing something in his arsenal. Now, look, look at the timing of it. This is actually very, very smart fight IQ. Very, very low risk. Very low risk. If, it's, if it doesn't happen, it, it's your chances of you getting knocked out or something are very, 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 very slim. Um, but it is, uh, it, it does show a lot because you show, Hey man, this guy's capable of rolling for a leg lock. So watch him. It's very nice. He just ducks right under shows a little level change ducks under Brad kicks out. I mean, it's very difficult to heel hook or even submit Brad for that matter. Um, but it, it, it was a very calculated risk because you saw Brad come off, out, off the clinch and throw a big knee and uh, try to get after him a little bit. So, so we have the, go ahead. You know, we had the end of the first round here. Brad does uh, what you said, you know, every, all, you train all your fighters to do, arms up at the end of the round. But how much, and I know you said, you know, Coach Ray Steffel is the head coach here, but what is being said to Brad in these moments here at the end of the first? So uh, for, for my role or anybody's role in the second, and I think talking about cornering, should be a very important part of what we do in this, in this segment here. Um, you got to remember, man, like the head coach is the head coach for a reason. And that's what the fighter wants. Um, you have to allow that head coach his time. So the way we do things is I won't say a word until Ray looks at me. So right now it's Ray's job to calm Brad down. The reason why Brad is sitting this direction is because uh, back then, um, you're only allowed one in the corner if the cut man came in. So the, the cut man came in, Brad adjusted his seat. So now that he can get water and also hear my instructions as well as Ray with his, without his back sitting to us. So right now I'm letting Ray uh, get Brad's breathing down corrected. And then Ray will give him some water, his point of instruction. And then he'll look over at me and then I'll give what I see. So um, what I remember out of this round here, so there's Ray talking. Ice in them. 
because I can't be in the cage. I can't ice them. They wouldn't allow me to jump over the cage or hang over the cage. Here's Ray's instructions. So what I remember uh, distinctly about round one, I'll pause it here before we get in round two, was we have a, we have a code for uh, some of, our, some of our, our, our low calf kicks. If you go back and watch Brad's fight against Talos Latis, we utilize the low calf kick a lot and damn near immobilized Talos Latis. Um, I know my leg hurt that entire camp and I could walk right for, for a long time because of that. But um, I asked Brad uh, to go to that kick and Brad said he broke his foot that first round. So I don't know where Brad broke his foot on. Uh, we did throw a lot of kicks, but um, I said, hey, is, the, is this there? And he said, no, it's not. And he pointed at his foot. Now, um, we didn't want to throw ice on the foot yet, mainly because we don't want the other corner to Just look over and see us ice in the foot. So we're too early in that moment, and we don't ice the foot yet, but we know his foot, his right foot is broken. Any suggestions or anything that you want to change now with this info that, that Brad gives you? Um, I want to wrestle more, but I want to chain wrestle. I don't want to uh, break off. Like if we, if we attack a wrestling exchange, um, if we're in on a double, go off to the single, go back to your double knee tap, just transitional wrestling. Don't give up on, don't give up on the one. Now, um, when you go off on, on a wrestling exchange, um, especially a guy like Israel, it might be good to shoot a double leg and then, um, see how deep you can get. And then we, what we call a pull pop. So we'll use our shoulder. We'll pull and pop them off, throw hands again to get the hands up and then reshoot deeper. So um, the pull pop exchanges were something that we wanted to, to establish a little bit more because Israel was doing a very good job of defensive wrestling. I'm ready for round two. If you are, yeah. let's go. Are we get we get another warning here in one of your fights? Herb Dean telling Izzy to watch his fingers. Yeah, Herb Dean's great. So now we know uh, open stance out of Israel. Open stance meaning orthodox versus southpaw. Israel's going to look for a lot of the body kicks, uh, body kicks to set up head kicks. So when we go to open stance, uh, I'm trying to make Brad adjust the front foot, adjust your front foot. There's the body kick there at the 430 mark. So we need to, we need to be hiding our footwork out of the southpaw stance. Now he readjusts back to orthodox. So, you know, it, this is probably just where it looks, Brad looks very uncomfortable in the striking. Hard, hard to find the range for him. And How much is it the array of strikes and the arsenal that Izzy had in this fight as much as it is the range? Like, what – if you could separate the two, because he's throwing a lot of everything, but he's also – uh, maintaining his range while doing so. Well, you know, talking about, um, I'm going to pause it real quick yeah. so we don't get too far, but uh, talking about the fighting at the Pearl where we thought it would be to our advantage because that cage is actually smaller. When you fight at the Pearl, the size of the cage is smaller and the, the game plan that we wanted to was, was to take away the space for Israel. We thought that was going to be uh, in our factor was to smother him. And, you know, is he, is probably next to him and McGregor two of the best at, at understanding space. And you're seeing this in this fight. And this is, this is an arguably, in my opinion, because I know Brad and how well, how great of a striker Brad is. So I look at this differently. Um, I think this is Israel's masterpiece as far as his striking goes, fainting, keeping distance, using his uh, all, everything, kicks, knees, elbows, punches. He does a great job, man. Spins. Love it. Well, I'm at 349 here. I'll resume Thanks. it. As he throws a head kick, it doesn't seem to affect Brad. Um, he's still throwing. Obviously, that one was with the uh, left leg. He throws the uh, low kick, but then shoots for a takedown. Again, has Izzy pressed up against the cage. Yep. So then there's, there's, this is what we talked about, um, you know, chain wrestling and pool popping. Now, let's pause it here. Uh, let's go yep. actually go back to um, – go. Ba let's go back to about 3.30. We're on the cage. Okay. So, uh, you know, here's some things, too, as a coach that I should have done better. I had, it, I had some tall guys for Brad, um, but Israel splits. He gets his, way, his legs very wide, and it's hard to collect on a double leg. Here we're more chest-to-chest. -chest. This is going to be a little bit more Greco style. 
But, um, you know, here we need to get better head position. Brad's head position should be on the, really on the underhook side because Izzy's actually dangerous here, leaning your head off to the right. He can throw his left knee. But watch what Izzy does. He digs his left arm, and now he controls Brad's right wrist. Okay, this is this is this is a lot. This is this is this is a lot of detail here. So Israel's controlling that wrist, which negates our knees. We can throw the knee, but we're susceptible to the takedown. But by controlling that hand, Israel's also able to use both sides of the cage as an exit, and he's able to throw his left knee if he wants at his disposal. Let's see what he does. Digs an underhook with it, turns him. I mean, just just very good. Very, very good. A lot, a lot better than we gave him credit for, that's for sure. And then the two guys separate, and we're back. So this is where we hope to keep the fight. This is, you know, Israel's very comfortable still being backed up. But watch how he takes away space again. Jabs, faints jabs. Now look where we're at. He backed us all the way up to the other side of the cage by throwing yes. one punch, hiding his footwork, hiding his footwork. Hands, and hands, motion, feet. And more so, he slides a lot. Slides a lot. So again, we talk about the, the, the smoke and mirrors, right? The hands are doing something, but while the hands are doing it, watch his feet. He slides right? and he slides in and it's yeah. Yeah. putting Brad in that proverbial red zone that you talked about. Exactly, so hands, but by, while using the hands, the feet are closing the distance and he's talking, you know, he's talking. And, and it, it, it's a mind game too for him. You know, what do you shook. tell your fighters when they have to go up against a guy like an Izzy who is doing all of the above closing just, distance, effective striking, and then talking throughout the whole time. Just to stay in your element. You know, um, we're still in round two, you know, we're, you, you, you're starting to see, uh, we're starting, you know, obviously you're getting worried, but you know the Brad's capabilities and what he's, uh, he's able to put anybody's lights out at any point. So you, you have to maintain faith, and you have to maintain the, uh, the idea that Brad can win this fight at any point, or he's not going to believe it either. So we have to maintain positivity and know that, hey, we're going to find a way to win this fight. We just got to fucking keep pressing. Do you ever have to, or have you ever had in these moments, check your fighters' emotions so that they're not re replying to their opponents? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes, you know, sometimes it turns into a, an ego, an ego contest or guys will say stuff or, or yell something and whatever, uh, looking at a stoppage right now, her beans warning, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you don't want the emotions to carry over too much. You want to stay within your element. Sometimes, uh, that's a cat and mouse game because, you know, you go watch, uh, Cody Garbrandt versus, uh, Dominic Cruz, Cody Garbrandt painted a masterpiece that fight. And then he fought TJ Dillashaw with so much emotion. And that took it out of them. Yeah, that's, that's a great, um, great fight to bring up because I remember asking Cody's uncle in that fight. I'm at the one minute mark left here in the second round. Um, I'm, I'm going to pause it. I'm going to pause it at one minute. Go ahead. Um, I remember talking to Cody's uncle, Coach Bob, Coach Stingray, as we got to know him on Ultimate Fighter. And I, and I asked him, you know, at any point in that Dominic Cruz fight, did you tell Cody to stop? Because me – just watching, I remember being out at a, at a bar watching the fight, and I'm screaming to just stop the dancing and, and, and just go finish the fight. Right. And he said, we, we, we said something to him in round three, and he said, Unc, I'm having too much fun. Yeah. And he said, at that moment, we just all shut up, and we just allowed him to do his thing. Let him go, and, man. And I don't know where you sit on that fight, but for my money, it would, it would make a top five for fighters who capture their first belt of their career. In their, in their first opportunity to get a, a title, top five performance, in my opinion. I, I agree in, in, the, in the fashion that he made arguably one of the best weights to ever do it in Dominic Cruz. He, he, he dominated that guy, you know? Emotion's a crazy part of the game, you know? And I, and I, I love Cody. I, I've never been shy about that. Um, part of it is the, the story in which Cody has. But I think a lot of people – notice that it's exactly what you talk about when he fights with the emotion it's when things are you know haven't gone his way the last turns, few fights turns into a coin flip yep continuing on here just about a minute left here in the second round watching brad tavares against israel adesanya 
at the Tough 27 finale, I believe 2018. So let's go to the 50, about 56 seconds. I'm going to pause it at 56 seconds. If you watch uh, Israel again, um, Israel is going to be in the open stance position, Southpaw versus Brad. Uh, now they touch lead hands. Now I pause it at the lead hand touch. The lead hand touch is going to give Israel his range. He's pawed at it. He goes back to orthodox. He'll hide the footwork again, throw the kick. A lot of just reestablishing footwork here. But he keeps showing that open stance kick to the body that he did earlier in that, like a couple seconds earlier. Oh, there's a show again. Now he's open stance again. Steps through. So, I mean, he's just showing one thing after another and mixing it up very well. So what is the thing for Brad then as he – because you're obviously, as the opponent, you, you need to read and react, but you don't want to put yourself in a bad spot. Correct. Um, at this point now, I think we're, we're going to have to try to utilize some different – I would say bail on the game plan, but we're going to have to try to utilize some different, uh, some different tactics. So – the one thing, too, that I, I wanted Brad to go now to um, was more to the body, you know, and we weren't, we weren't throwing a lot to the body at all. Everything was head hunting, and Israel was sliding just a bit out of range every time, so his head was not available to strike, but his body was. So that was something that we talked about that, um, you know, we, we wanted to utilize more was get to that guy's body, see, see, see what his body does now. So, um, again, back in the corner, uh, you know, Rob Monroe, very, very accomplished cut man, one of the best in the game. And then the, the Hall of Famer, masterpiece, Ray Seffo, man, doing his job. Again, like this is just a calming, a calming voice in the corner. I think um, I'm probably talking to him now a little bit about the body work here. You know, that was a nice head kick in that replay. You know, yeah, although it didn't land flush, man, it still hurts. You're blocking that on your hands. Um, catching it off with forearms. And uh, we actually, Brad, he broke Brad's arm. So Brad was out about a year after that round there because uh, uh, broke Brad's wrist. So now Brad is fighting with a broken foot and a broken forearm. And what does that say to you as a coach, knowing that he's now compromised two parts of his body? But well, we didn't know about the forearm yet because, you know, Brad's a warrior and he didn't say shit about it. And the, only, and the only reason why he, I knew about his foot is because I asked for a certain technique and, and he said, it's just not available. So um, he wouldn't have said anything had I not asked for that technique. So this is just Brad, man. Like this dude's a, this dude, we call it mana, right? The warrior spirit, Paul right. the warrior spirit. He's got that mana. So um, again, like now we're looking at uh, the swing round here, two rounds to Israel, none for us. You can win round three and start changing that momentum. But again, I, I just need Brad to be an athlete, move around more, more level changes, try to find the body, establish some of his kicks, but we can't with the right foot. So he's got a very nice switch kick. We call it a one, two high eight. So a jab cross uh, switch kick. He needs to get his kicks firing as well. Now I'm not sure where you're at. I'm at about 335. Yep, we right saw, there. We saw Izzy throw that knee and we saw Brad get fired up. Mm. A lot of people have a lot of different opinions on something like that. What, when you, knowing Brad, when you see him get amped up after taking that knee, what are you thinking? Again, it's just, it's just knowing Brad, like that he loves this type of fight. He, he loves, he loves adversity and he loves a firefight. Um, but again, it's, 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 we have to be smart, you know, we have to be calculated and it can't always be a war. The Tim Boach fight comes, uh, comes to mind with, with Brad knowing that, hey, we were winning that fight handedly and, and it turned into a firefight and Boach, uh, Boach knocked Brad down and we lost the fight. So by history alone, we, you have to know your fighter, the good and the bad. But he seems a lot more active in this round. I'm about 240 left in round three. He's pressing more. It doesn't necessarily seem like the style bender show in this round. Yeah, and it could uh, it could even be a little bit of gamemanship on Styler Bender's part where he knows he's got one and two in the bag. He doesn't have to do as much in round three. He can kind of just coast if he wants. Um, 
and, and win, win this round by coasting and not exerting himself to save up for uh, the championship rounds. He's Are doing you, a, go ahead. He's doing a really good job on that lead leg, Israel. Very good oh. sprawl again. And we've seen Brad kind of go for the takedown and take Izzy to the cage multiple times in this fight. What can you advise him to do to change that result? Come up to the head. So when you shoot low, shoot low, get him to sprawl, and then collar tie up to the head, and then look to snap down. So just some, just some, just some little things there that we, sh we should have done better at. So here we're on the hips now. Again, drive in. Uh, look for some trips because of how tall Israel is. Inside trip, hooking the legs. Now here, you know, you got to make sure we're breathing. I would uh, – now at this point, he just basically olays us, puts us on our back or, or back to the cage again, elbows off the break. You know, beautiful job by Izzy. Pinned a hand to the hip and threw the elbow off the break. So they just showed the significant strikes. Izzy, clear advantage in two. Uh, somewhat of an advantage in three rounds one – or round one, excuse me, was very, very close. Um, but knowing what we know – with a minute left in the third round. Does the um, eagerness get turned up here in, in the corner? Yeah, I mean, I, I just remember thinking like, dude, we got to put this guy on his back or we got to do something to slow this dude's pace down, you know? Um, but how, how do, we, how do we get there? Okay, well, we need to start figuring that out. Well, he's throwing a lot of kicks right there do we, at the 30 second mark. You try to crowd the kick and get him on one foot and run a takedown off the kick. Right? Do you try to run more single legs? Is it going to be chest to chest? How do we? How do we get to? The, it's easy to say, "Hey, go score a takedown," but how do you? How do you apply it? Because Israel's been shutting that shit down too. And, and I would think part of that too is not only go score a takedown, but what do you do once you have the takedown? Exactly. So uh, for us, you want to stay in half guard because of Israel's length. You want to uh, control that bottom leg. I'd stay in half guard and look to cook them. You know until he until you can maybe advance or dominate a better position from there but half guard especially by how tall he is and how well brad does in half guard so we're at the end of round three here and, and coach I, as we get ready for round four i just want to say this has been a lot of fun finding yeah. myself get, getting smarter here i i get, i can tell you're getting a little amped at, in certain moments and uh just doing what i do and reading into things it, it's very cool to see you actually breaking down the footage it's not like you already came in with it broken down and you're, you're not John Gruden me you're not saying all right this is I want to go back to this 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 and this like you already knew it it's kind of you're reacting in the moment so it, yeah. it's pretty cool no I, I, I really like this a lot because you know this this there's this is such an emotional game man and you know Brad is Brad is by far one of my closest friends I've been a part of his UFC career for I think 11 fights and uh you know um yeah, man, it's, I, I don't like seeing my friend – no one does. No one wants to see your friend, like, in a, in a compromised position. Um, but you have to maintain some sort of poker face, and, and you want to make sure that you give him the best information possible. Uh, we're at a point now where, you know, we're desperate. We're in desperate mode now, right? We need to make something happen. And, again, like, I have all the faith in the world that Brad's a guy that can, that can pull something out here, even, even the way the fight's going. Like, Brad has that capability. You know, he's on him right away. So we're at, I'm about 445 right now. Yep, I'm right there with you. God, Israel's good, man. This guy's good. So there's our, there's our shot again at the takedown. He redirects us right away, right? So he redirects the momentum. He did a great job of that uh, again and again. So now we're going to drop down. He's looking to drop down the double. Look at that wide split by Israel. You can't get your hands together, right? So now we switch off to the single. Uh, he should be stepping around the back leg, take his right leg and step around the back of the right, uh, Israel's left leg. We score the takedown now. So Israel to guard right away. Brad at a zero, we call that a zero all the way down. His guard position is at a zero, which is uh, now look at Israel's activity. He's throwing elbows at the back of the head. He's creating space. He threatens for a heel. Up kicks, we're trying to fold him over. Now we're in a triangle position brad spins off the triangle which now gives up israel's back we want to control here we don't want to throw him over now we have a back 
okay, shit, we got something here, but we don't want to rush it, right? He clears. And you're hopes. right there in this yeah. moment. So what are you saying here? Uh, to control the hips, to control the hips, and to kill a bo- kill one leg. Uh, don't rush the hooks, and we rush the hooks, and and we basically got bucked off. And Israel does a great job with a Kimura reversal, puts us in a compromised spot again, flattens us out, and now we're pinned on the cage. And that's going to be a moment of distress, um, a mental fuck, you know? It's like, oh, fuck. For all of us, you know, shit. We had him down, um, and we didn't get what we wanted, you know? And he's right back on us again, chopping the leg, moving great. You know, he looks like he can fight another five rounds. But is there any sense of encouragement knowing that Brad was able to get Izzy's back in that moment? Always, always. I mean, it wasn't a chink in the armor by any means. Like, we didn't, weren't, weren't close to a finish. But, again, like, I'm, I, it might, maybe to the listeners, I might sound, I might sound dumb, but I, I always have the utmost faith in especially a guy like Brad. So, I mean, anything that we can do to, to get a finish, we're, we're looking for. I think they're checking that Brad, uh, Brad's cut right now. Yeah. Yeah, the, the cut opens up there. Um, so they're showing the. Go yeah, ahead. wow! Just a, just a beautiful lead elbow out of southpaw. I mean, the, I mean, look at look at the creativity in this man striking. Pin the wrist, push the wrist down, and come over top with the elbow. Just such well, a creative artist. Well, anyone who thinks you're dumb can uh, I will ban <laughs> from YouTube. All right, they won't be able to see, see or or hear anything, and uh, they shouldn't be around the fight game. Let me ask you this: Is where just approaching, I believe we're going to get close to the two-minute mark here in the fourth round. You've now seen nearly four rounds of Israel Adesanya early in his UFC career. Did you know or did you have a feeling of just how good he could become uh, during this fight against Brad? After this fight, I, I was like, man, that was, that was a, a great litmus test for him, and he passed, you know, and uh, I, by no means was I surprised to see him uh, hold that belt. In, in such a short amount of time after this fight, especially, you know, you think this was that fight to kind of get him to where he needed to be in terms of being with the UFC and the caliber of competition that he would face. Well, I think he, he's a guy who's very confident in his own skill set as it is to begin with, but I think this solidified it for him. You know, I don't think that he had any doubt in his mind, but I think by, by his actions in this fight and what he was able to implement, he walked away with this fight knowing, and I could I could fight for the title tomorrow if I needed to. By Pat, he he passed the test he needed to pass in I, this I fight. Think, absolutely, absolutely. But I think that's a credit to not only Izzy but you guys and, and Brad himself that he, Brad was the test that Izzy needed to pass. Because I think if you ask a lot of fans, and, and I know we still have one more round to break down. I'm a minute left here in round four, yeah. but a, a, a lot of fans will only point to the last minute Anderson Silva fight. Right. That's right. the one that people people are like, oh, when he beat Anderson, I knew he'd be the champion. Right. And, and it's great to hear. And, again, part of the concept of this show is, you no, know, no, listen, once he fought my guy, we knew there was something there. Well, you're only as good as sometimes as your dance partner. And this dance partner that he has in the cage right now is one of the most game guys you're ever going to see in, in, in MMA. And I, know, I know Brad didn't, didn't show um, what he's capable of in the last fight against Edmund. Again, another, another unbelievable talent. But if you go back and look at Brad's losses, he's lost a, a Robert Whitaker and he's lost to Israel Adesanya. Um, he's lost to Yoel Romero. These are all title contenders, the top of the top, you know, in the middleweight division. And we need to, as a coaching staff and as, as a fighter, to f- find a way to, for Brad to get over that hump because we know what he's capable of, you know. Um, here we are going into round five. And now this is a, this is a matter of pride, to be quite honest with you, Mike. Um, you know, in a loss, in a loss like this, there's there's not a whole lot you can you can take out of this. But in this position now, there's a lot of pride. There's a lot of pride, and there's Dan Ige in the corner with us. You see Dan Ige to my right. Um, you know, this is a family affair now, and a lot of people, a lot of people in this situation would find a way out. They would quit. They would pack up their shit and they would go home. And right now we're fighting for pride and we're fighting for our families and we're fighting for our teammates to show them that, yes, this is, a, this is not going our way, 
but we're going to end this fucking fight and we're going to, we're going to end it on our feet. Now, what does it say to you? We're looking at this cut and it's a, it's a big cut in the eyebrow area there for Brad. But now as we reflect on it, it's got a broken foot, a broken wrist and a big cut. And you said it's a family affair and we're going out and we're doing this, not just for ourselves, but to show our team and to show everyone around us that we're going to end this fight the right way. What does that say? And I, and I know he's a good friend of yours, but what, what does that say to you about Brad Tavares? Ah, uh, damn. You know, it's tough, man. I get emotional just talking about him. He's, he's, he's a team captain. You know, he's, he, he emphasizes damn near everything what we want to be as a team and, uh, and who we are in our fighting personality and our styles. Um, we all look up to him, you know, and he leads by example, uh, the way he sets foot in the gym and things that he does at his shrink couture. And I know, I know what a lot of the casuals and people will say, like, and they see this fight, but they don't really understand the depth of what Brad brings to us as a, as a, as a unit, as a team. And we see that, uh, when he's not in the room, you know, we miss having him around when he's not in the room. So, um, Man, I, I just – I love the guy to death, and I wouldn't want to go to battle with really anybody else in the world than Brad. I mean, we always say that to each other, man, to hell and back, you know, and this is it. So this is hell right now, and uh, we, now we got to walk back. we got four minutes left here in the fifth and final round. Um, Izzy's got control here on the ground. If there's – and obviously if people go back and watch this fight, how could you pull positive, you know, the negative people and the casuals, they'll, they'll be like, how could he ever pull positives out of this? Even when you're seeing this and you see Izzy with the position and Brad's about to roll through here um, or attempt to roll through, I thought he had it there. Um, do you pull positives out of this? Absolutely. I mean, look at that spot he was in. There's guys that I can name by name, by name that would have quit there, right? They would have they found a way out. This is, this is not where you, you don't want three more minutes left of this. And Brad welcomed it. You know, there's guys that would have just said, Hey man, I'm, there's no fucking, there's no path to victory for me here. Let me just get out of this and save face. And he didn't. And I, I've never been more proud of, of any fighter in a loss than I have been of Brad, you know, look at him. I mean, he's, he's still fighting. He's still fighting. Now this was never a scenario. Somebody asked me, um, I can't remember who, but somebody asked me, hey, did you think about um, stopping the fight? And I was like, never even crossed my mind. Right, right. Never even crossed my mind. Not a guy like Brad, because I know if I would have stopped the fight, Brad would have fucking hit me in the head <laughs> right then and there, you know? So, no. But this was, this in a loss, this was Brad's moment. Brad, Brad, uh, Brad showed true mana. He showed, he showed mana in this fight. So and I think, I think he gained Israel's respect. To that point, um, and, and I don't mean this in any disrespect in any way, but outside of the potential, maybe he scores a big shot and he wins the fight by knockout or he, you know, is he compromises himself and the submission is there. How much do you just want Brad or do you believe Brad was just like, I'm just going to get through this fight. I'm going to make it to the final bell and I'm just going to show so much more about who I am as a fighter and as a person instead of maybe just hoping for the uh, come from behind victory? A little bit of both. I mean, look at him. I mean, he's even actively shooting still. He's, he's doing his best in what he has available to him. And, uh, you know, I think it's a bit of both. I mean, his, his wife is there, his, uh, his kids there, his family, everybody's there. So, this is this is this this is the type of fighter that you want to have, man. Like you want a guy that's 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 willing to 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 hang it, leave it leave it all in the cage, you know. And like you said, this he was the guy that Izzy needed to have a test on in mm -hmm. order to find out his place in the UFC. And uh, you know, I think it's a it's a test. And if you look for you know. Uh, some positives on both ends here it's a test that I think both had to pass although mm -hmm. the fight didn't go Brad's way he passed the test of you know inner strength and you know that warrior mentality that you speak of and, and I think it speaks volumes to like you said it's why he's a team captain and who he is as a person as a fighter yeah you gain so much out of the losses and I know it's a cliche to think say it's like oh you you win or you learn yeah you know it is part of it and I think losses are good 
um, they're good for everybody, man. They're good for your coaching staff. They're good for your gym. Uh, you don't want to take too many of them. Don't get me wrong, but right, sometimes, right. sometimes a, a loss is, uh, is, is able to light a fire under your ass to understand what you need to do to be better. So I got 10 seconds left here. If you have closing thoughts on this, I know we spoke a lot about Brad and, and his mental and, and physical fortitude because in a moment where a lot of people could have given up, he never did. And you see a huge sign of respect here between both guys. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, I was blown away by, by Israel. You know, I got to give credit where credit's due. Uh, you know, we thought the camp that we had and, and you know, there's no excuses there for us. We didn't, we didn't have any excuses, you know, and uh, he did a, he did an unbelievable job with uh his skill set and then and then neutralized ours and what we wanted to do and then we had to make some audibles and then some more audibles and then you know he just he outclassed us in that fight and all credit to him and and there's a reason why he's champion what do you see of izzy's future because i i I think in today's age and, and as someone who has seen him grow from this fight against brad to where he's at now and you know i I, thankfully, no one reads my shit because I kind of mentioned how, you know, this may be the best possible thing to happen to Izzy is this quarantine because so many people are now focused on getting their jobs back, getting back to normal life. And yes, fight fans want fights. But if Dana White came out on May 1st and was like, Israel out of Sanya's fight and Paulo Costa June 5th or whatever, no one's going to be like, well, his last fight against Joel was terrible. I don't want to, right, no one right. cares anymore because we're so fight starved uh, of, you know, our top talents. Do you think Izzy's a guy who can go down in some of the greatest to ever compete, not only in middleweight, but in just the UFC? Oh, 100%. I mean, so you look at like all the, the factors that you want to kind of delve into and, and look at his camp for one, you know, and uh, Eugene Beerman and the guys that he has over Doug Vinny over at uh, city kickboxing. And um, so that's, that's, that's short up. Like he has a great camp. He, uh, he, um, he's one of the most creative strikers that I've ever seen. And the one hole that you want to try to implement obviously was his wrestling and his ground game. And we've seen him time and time again, pass uh, every one of those challenges, you know, uh, in the Yo Romero fight, I was blown away that Romero didn't try to wrestle him more, but historically we haven't seen Romero wrestle very much since the Brad Tavares fight. Romero's fallen in love with knocking people out. So that might not be his best attribute as it once was, you know, I'm not saying Romero can't wrestle, but I'd like to see him utilize that a little bit more too. And, uh, you know, I think that um, the Paulo Costa fight and Israel fight, I've cornered against both of those guys. Um, I think it is, it is as advertised and they're going to pull the best out of each other. And that's what you're going to see from that fight. I think when you watch the Romero and Izzy fight, Israel did the smart thing and did enough to just win. That was it. Yeah. You took that. You took my question right out of my mouth. I was going to ask you if you thought it was a smart performance from Izzy, because there are some people who know the sport who were overly energized by Izzy's performance, you know, and listen, the best way to put it is, I will never go step in front of a freight train. I just won't. I never will. I know the repercussions. Yeah. And so does everyone around me. So, yeah, yeah you, you, you took that directly out of, out of my mouth. So, as we'll wrap up here with a few just outside of these fight questions, I don't need any news from you. But uh, there's reports. Are you preparing for May 9th? Yeah, we're, we are. We're preparing for it. Um, you know, again, that's that's what we're that w- that's what we've been told. We haven't been told the location or anything else. So um, our day to day has been been has been the same. Um, once once the, you know today was supposed to be fight day for us again. You know, April eighteenth. Once that got canceled, um, I gave Francis a couple days off and just said, "Hey, man, why don't, why don't you just take a few days and relax and rest your body?" He looked unbelievable in his um, last three sparring sessions, and I was very happy with where we were at. So. Um, and then again, it got canceled for the 18th and we, you know, just kind of told him, I said, look, we're not going to dictate what we do on these fight cards anymore. We're just going to go in and we're going to work and we're going to be prepared for whatever comes to us. 
I'd rather have us work in than not and try to make up for lost time. Let's just be in the gym and, and get our ass to work and build. There's still a lot of uncertainty and on this, you know, thought of Francis and Ghana. There's a lot of uncertainty about the top of the heavyweight division. It, it's April 18th. The fight's scheduled possibly for May 9th. Would you like to see them implement an interim title? Yeah, I mean, that, that we prepared for a five-round fight initially when the, on the ESPN card, so we're ready for five if that's the case. But, you know, it's up to the UFC and, and what trajectory they're trying to put both these men on. It would make sense. You know, I think, I think if uh, Jarzinho is able to come away with the win, he should be next in line as, as well as, as obviously us. Um, you know, Francis has been on record saying he doesn't even need to take this fight. He's next in line, but it's a matter of how long do we want to wait. So uh, it's a calculated risk, you know, where we, we could uh, go in and, and beat this guy and it doesn't do a whole lot for where he's at in his career. We're next in line for that title shot one way or another. So with the delays and the timing of it, it's almost kind of way, you know, I spoke to his manager. I'm like, well, shit, it might even be just work now, wait to see how this thing all shakes out. Maybe we get Stipe next, you know, because DC might be to the point where he's just going to retire and not wait till, you know, December. God knows how long this is going to take. So we don't know. We don't know. So at the end of the day, we're in control of ourselves and, 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 and our training and our cardio. And I don't want to just get a phone call and be like, Hey, you guys are fighting next week. And we're sitting at home eating the pizza, you know, we need right. to be ready, ready to go. So. Yeah, I will, I will tell you, and you can share this with Francis, uh, if, if he remembers our interview, which I, I'm sure he doesn't. But uh, there's a moment in there when I ask him about the interim heavyweight title, and he says, listen to me. And I almost shit myself. <laughs> and everyone listening was like, you know, how, how quickly did you listen? I was like, I was listening the whole time. But uh, mm. knowing Francis and the statue that he carries and the way he said it, I was, he was like, listen to me. This is what I believe. And I was like, well, whatever you believe, sir, I am all in. Uh, sure. Francis Ngannou is the gospel, but uh, yeah. it's great. My, my, one of my last ones here for you, Coach, and uh, yeah. again, thank you so much for your time. Are you, I don't want to say energized or excited, but are, are you uplifted by the promotion's efforts right now to get, get a schedule back together and, and start getting fights? Not only is it beneficial for you, your fighters, but, I, and, and I hate to get emotional about it, but this is something the world needs right now. I'm losing – listen, I, I just put out a tweet earlier today. I've been able to do about 25 interviews in this whole quarantine month. That's the most I've had in a very long time, and I'm thankful for everyone, including yourself, who's giving me their time. But I need purpose on a weekend, on a Saturday. I need to see these stories because I'm, I'm in this game to be a, a storyteller. I can't tell stories if everything's on pause. So are, are right. you uplifted by the promotion's efforts to push forward? Absolutely. And, and, you know, you can, you can argue and debate about the timing of it. And this is, this is what and who Dana White is. He's a promoter and his job is to go out and put the best fights available and push that envelope and, and be on the cutting edge and without putting people at risk. And I, I have the utmost faith that he wouldn't do that, um, that he would put us, put us in a, in a, in a situation that wouldn't compromise anyone's health. And uh, yeah, man, I mean, this is what, this is what we signed up for. Um, I would never want to equate what we do by any military means whatsoever, because that's not what we do. But what we want to do is look at what the military does so well. And the military doesn't care, a military personnel person doesn't care political views or this is or that. Their job is to go and defend their country, right? So in a, in, a, in a way, not like them, but in a way, our job is to go and fight and be prepared no matter what's going on on the outside. That's our job. That's what we signed up for. You know, we're not, we're not going to war by any means or doing anything like that. But at the same time, we have a job that we're supposed to be ready for at all times. When the phone rings, we need to be ready. We need to get our ass in there and go perform. And we need to be the best at our capability. So I think what Dana is doing is, is spot on. It gives a lot of people hope. Um, the one thing I do hope that when people get out of this situation and when the fights do come, come back, be a little bit more of, a, of a, 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 a sense of positivity and light. You know, a lot of trolls and a lot of people on there want to say hateful and hurtful stuff. But while this, while this moment's gone, a lot of people are missing what, what's going on in the cage too and the entertainment factor that they bring. So before you want to say something crude or, or shitty about a fighter, know, know the risks that they're taking to go and entertain your ass. Coach, this has been awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, can't wait for us to get back to fights. And uh, I know you and I will be talking, but uh, thanks for being the first of this uh, video series. And uh, 
keep, you know, best of luck to you moving forward towards May 9th and uh, sending my best to you and your family during this time. And uh, I, I know we'll stay in touch. Yeah, definitely, man. This is a great, this is great, Mike. And I think it's going to be really good for the, for the fans to, to sit down and break down some stuff. But I, I urge a lot of you guys, if you have Fight Pass or you have the option to jump on there, you know, go over and look, in, and look at some of that stuff too and take your own notes and start to, start to dissect and become uh, better at your own fight IQ. So this is a great platform for them to start doing that, Mike. I think you're on, on to something very big here. Thank you, Coach. And uh, hopefully, hopefully we get some fights on May 9th. And uh, I, I'm, I know we'll talk soon, but uh, thanks again, Coach. Yes, sir. Hey, good to talk to you, Mike. I'll talk to you soon, brother. All right. Later. All right.